Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter, our city clerk. Uh, good evening and welcome to our virtual meeting of Brampton's Planning and Development Committee. Uh, this meeting will be held through remote electronic participation in accordance with the Municipal Act 2001 as amended by Bill 187, the Municipal Emergency Act 2020 and an order in council from March 2020, which amended the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act and prohibits organized public events of more than five people. City Council has authorized virtual meetings of its committee with all members participating remotely to facilitate the continuation of city business during this current pandemic. We will begin the meeting with the city clerk calling the roll for attendance at today's meeting. Members of council, or members of committee, sorry, I will call your name, Councillor Santos. Here. Councillor Vasante. Present. Councillor Willens. Present. Councillor Pileschi. I'm here. Councillor Bowman. Present. Chair Medeiros is here. Councillor Williams uh, will be arriving late. Councillor Fortini. I'm here, thank you. Councillor Singh. I'm here, thank you. And Councillor Dillon is not yet here. Um, so Mr. Chair, you do have quorum, you can proceed. Okay, thank you very much. Our next item is approval of the agenda. I will ask the clerk to first review the changes to the agenda since the publication of the proposed consolidated agenda on Friday evening. So Mr. Chair, as you can appreciate, there are a number of changes to this evening's agenda. And I'm just going to bring up the changes. Just bear with me here one moment, please. Um, the agenda changes since the publication of the proposed consolidated this past um, Friday evening were um, emailed to members of council, or excuse me, members of committee prior to the start of tonight's meeting at around six o'clock. Um, in, in regard to item 6.2, delegations uh, for an application to amend the zoning bylaw and proposed draft plan of subdivision to permit residential townhouse development um, by one, uh, or excuse me, Weston Consulting Group, south of Wanless Drive between Credit View Road and Chinkuzi Road, um, 1265 through to 1329 Wanless Drive. There were a number of delegations. The first listed delegation on the proposed consolidated agenda from Tejas Johnny will not be presenting this evening, but we have additional delegations from the public, Scott Stewart and Despina Spencer. We also have a delegation from the applicant, um, Michael Vani, and he will be presenting after the staff um, presentation this evening. And the applicant will also be available for any questions, should there be any from the committee. In regard to delegation 6.5, there are additional delegations um, through till six delegations for that particular item. In regard to uh, delegation item 6.6, .6, um, which um, there is a video delegation that will be played for the committee. There are no other delegations uh, in person or virtual delegations for that item. Item 14.1, which is various correspondence regarding the um, townhouse development proposal by Weston Consulting at Wanless Drive. There are a total of, I believe, uh, 16 different pieces of correspondence now um, that have been provided to members of committee. And then item 14.2, which is correspondence in regards to a townhouse development uh, regarding Havenwood properties, uh, east of Financial Drive, north of Steeles Avenue West. Uh, there are a total of 18 pieces of correspondence for members of committee to consider. Um, item 14.4 is correspondence regarding um, an application to amend the zoning bylaw to permit a concrete batching plant. There are a total of five pieces of correspondence that have been provided to committee. And finally, um, delegation, or excuse me, um, consent items 8.4 and 8.5 uh, are listed for consent, but we do have delegations related to those items, so they should be removed from the consent agenda when committee gets to the consent motion. Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, our city clerk. Um, does any member wish to add a business item to today's meeting? If so, please use the chat function in WebEx to add your name to the speakers list. Uh, okay, I see. Uh, Councilor Maduros, this is Councilor Dillon. I'm just having a little bit of difficulty. Can you repeat what you just said? Okay, I just said, does, does any member wish to add a business item to today's meeting? If so, please use the chat function in WebEx to add your name to the speakers list. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I see. Councillor yep. Vasante has added his name. 
Uh, oh, he would like to add a new item. Okay, Councilor Vasante. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to add a new business item discussion on Churchville land conveyance. So, Mr. Chair, that would be proposed item under new business. So it would be 10.1 on tonight's agenda. Okay, thank you. And I do see Councillor Singh and Councillor Bowman, but that's for consent. Okay, so um, are there any more additions to this agenda? Seeing none. So I have a motion moved by Councillor Singh to approve the agenda that the agenda for the regular planning and development committee meeting of June 22nd be approved. Uh, I will ask, is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Okay, thank you. There are no objections, so the motion carries. Uh, as we all continue to preserve, uh, persevere in these extraordinary times, Planning and Development Committee is permitted to fully conduct virtual meetings to support physical distancing and comply with public gathering restrictions while ensuring the business of the municipality can continue. Meetings of municipal councils are to be open to the public for transparency and accountability, and our meetings will continue to be as well with a few precautions and limitations. In-person attendance at this meeting is severely restricted. Members and most staff are participating electronically in this meeting. This public can still ac access and participate in the meeting by a few measures. Watching this meeting remotely through the city's live stream and playback of the archived video stream after tonight's meeting has concluded and prior to the start of the meeting, pre-registration with the city clerk's office to speak as a delegation before the committee during this virtual meeting to share your comments and provide your input on a specific agenda item on tonight's meeting agenda. Prior to the start of tonight's meeting, sending written audio or video submissions to the city clerk's office to be provided to the committee for consideration during this virtual meeting as your input on a specific agenda item. And during tonight's meeting, submitting questions about the agenda businesses, recommendations made by committee tonight by emailing the city clerk's office at cityclerksoffice at brampton.ca with your question, which may be read into the public uh, record during the public question period sections on today's agenda. A final reminder for members of committee, before we start to consider today's agenda's business, please ensure your video is off and microphone is muted until you are assigned the floor. Then you can turn both on when you speak. This will help ensure only one person is speaking at one time and minimize other background disruptions during this meeting. So we go on to pecuniary interest. Does any members have a declaration of pecuniary interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act for any matter to be considered on today's agenda? Seeing none, the clerk will so note uh, for the meeting minutes. Now we go on to consent agenda. So I do believe I have a list of Councillor Singh. Yes, um, uh, thank you, Chair. And through you, I'd like to remove uh, 8.10 from consent. Okay. Uh, our next is, uh, I believe, Councillor Bowman. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. As mentioned by our city clerk, I would like to remove item 8.5 as we do have a delegation and I have comments as well. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Santos. Thank you. Um, would like to uh, remove 8.6 and 8.9. I just have some short comments and questions. Okay, thank you. And now Councillor Pileshi. Thank you. I'd like to remove uh, eight seven and eight eight. Great. We really have an active uh, committee today, so it seems we've pulled everything from consent. If I'm not mistaken, City Clerk. That is correct, Mr. Chair. So we can move on. Uh, there is no consent okay. motion to approve. Sorry. Um, can I? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Councilor Singh. Yep. Uh, I'm just getting the number, but the um, um, we're okay to move the. Uh, the report on zero airport road, I believe. Uh, I'm just trying to get the number. If any councillor can help me out right now, I'm just looking through the. Uh, uh, that 8. would be 7. Eight seven that I just removed. You removed it. Oh, you want to speak to it? I do, please. Okay, no problem. Okay, thank you very much. So, as uh, no, there's nothing in consent. We go now on to our statutory public meetings report. Our next section of tonight's agenda is the statutory public meetings item. This is a public meeting of the Planning and Development Committee held in accordance with the requirements of the Planning Act of Ontario. The proposals to be heard at this public meeting are the result of applications made under the Planning Act. Uh, these are not proposals of the City of Brampton unless they are specifically identified as city-initiated proposals. Tonight, one of our five statutory public meetings items 
is a city-initiated proposal. The intent of this public meeting is to receive submissions from the public regarding these proposals. Given we have persons watching this meeting through the city's live stream, we will have staff present each of the five applications subject to a statutory public meeting. After receiving any pre-registered uh, delegations, members of the committee may ask questions for clarification, but will not engage in debate on the proposal at this time. Committee consideration of the proposal will occur at a future meeting when planning staff bring forward the final recommendation report on each proposal. The city also has posted to its website supporting information and documentation for these development applications for public review and reference. Uh, we will now proceed to consider the five items on this evening's statutory public meetings agenda. After consideration of the five items, committee will deal with the balance of the agenda items on tonight's agenda. So our first one is in fact a city initiated amendment to the zoning bylaw to adjust parking permissions within special policy area 16 in the Brampton East secondary plan. Uh, I believe I will hand this over to our uh, Natasha Ray. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of committee, and members of the public. My name is Natasha D'Souza Ray. I am the planner assigned to process and review the city initiated application to amend the zoning for lands in the Bram East Secondary Plan area. The purpose of this public meeting is to provide information to the public and seek feedback on the application. No decision will be made at tonight's meeting. A recommendation report will be brought forward to committee to consider at a later date. The subject lands are located in Ward 8, and these lands are bounded by the Gore Road, Ebenezer Road, Vogel Road, and Nexus Avenue. Next, next slide, please. Next slide, please. In October 2019, City Council adopted bylaw 260-2019. This established the M42568 zone. This zoning was necessary in order to recognize non-industrial permissions and make it consistent with Special Policy Area 16 of the Brammy Secondary Plan. The M42568 zone that came into effect in 2019 requires a minimum of 650 parking spaces and does not permit additional gross floor area. The intention behind this provision was to ensure that an appropriate amount of parking is available throughout the subject lands. However, the restriction on gross floor area inadvertently restricts development on a vacant lot, as well as any future redevelopment within the M42568 zone. As such, this city-initiated zoning bylaw amendment that is being presented today proposes to delete the requirement of a minimum 650 parking spaces and remove the gross floor area restriction. Instead, a parking ratio is proposed in the zoning that will allow future parking requirements to be based on the gross floor area of future development. Next slide, please. In terms of where we are in the process, this application was circulated to commenting departments and agencies and public notice of this virtual public meeting was provided in the Branton Guardian earlier this month. Next slide, please. Direct mail notice was provided to property owners in the identified catchment area as depicted on this slide. The report associated with tonight's meeting is available online. The presentation will be available online shortly. Again, no decisions on the zoning will be made this evening. Any feedback received from this evening's public meeting will be considered in a recommendation report to be considered at a future committee meeting. Thank you. This concludes my presentation on this item, and I've included my contact info on the previous slide. Thank you very much. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any uh, delegations? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, we do. We have one delegation from Pritam Singh, and uh, Pritam is, is in the session right now. And um, members of committee and to Pritam, just a reminder that uh, the public is given up to five minutes for their delegation. There will be a time check at, with 30 seconds left just to have them uh, conclude their remarks. And uh, the delegation may be subject to any questions or clarification by the committee members after their delegation. Yeah, so uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, go ahead. Okay. 
Yeah, good evening, respectful Mr. Chairman and Councilors and staff. My name is Pridham Singh. I'm here as a representative of the Gore Plaza, Inc., owners of an empty lot that is within the zoning bylaw at hand. Yeah, so my understanding is that the minimum 650 parking spaces, as well as no additional gross floor area, is going to be deleted uh, and amended to uh, provide one space for every 22 square meters of gross floor area and uh, yeah, uh, 22 meters of net worship area in a place of worship scenario. So I believe, is that correct? That's all I have to say. Okay, does staff have any, uh, any comment? Well, through you, Mr. Chair, that is correct in terms of what's proposed in the, the draft amendment. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now I have a motion moved by Councillor Dillon, uh, or sorry, are there any members of the committee would like to speak to this? No? Okay, I have a motion moved by Councillor Dillon to approve the staff report uh, recommendations and receive all related uh, delegations. Uh, that the motion, uh, that the report titled City Initiated Amendment to the Zoning Bylaw to Adjust Parking Permissions Within Special Policy Area 16 in the Bramney Secondary Plan to the Planning Development Service Committee meeting of June 22, 2020 be received. That staff be directed to report back to Planning and Development Services Committee with the results of the public meeting and the staff recommendation and that a copy of this report and council resolution be forwarded to the Region of Appeal for information. That the delegations in regard to this item be received. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you, there are no objections, so the motion carries. Statutory public meeting for this item is now adjourned. Uh, we go over to the next one, staff report uh, item 5.2, application to amend the zoning bylaw and proposed draft plan of subdivision uh, south of uh, uh, Wainless Drive between Credit View and Chincuzi Road, Ward 6. And I will now ask a uh, presentation by uh, Stephen Dykstra. Yeah, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the committee and the public. My name is Stephen Dykstra and I'm the development planner assigned to process and review this application to amend the zoning bylaw. The purpose of this public meeting is to provide information to the public and also to seek feedback on the application. It should be reminded that no decisions will be made at this meeting. It's for information purposes only. Next slide. The subject properties are located on the south side of Wampus Drive, somewhere between Credit View and Chincuzi Road. It's located within an existing community and north of a woodlot, which is also a wetland. Next slide. The surrounding land uses include single detached residential dwellings, a local road system, a woodlot to the south, and a stormwater management to the north. The application is proposing to permit a residential subdivision of about 53 units, including townhouses and semi-detached houses. This proposal requires <clears throat> sorry, a zoning bylaw amendment to permit the townhouses and an open space to facilitate the amenity area and the buffer to the south. Draft plan of subdivision is also going to be created to create the lots and blocks for development. Next. Highlights of the proposal include it's a subdivision of 53 units, of which 43 are going to be townhouse units. Five are proposed to be semi-detached dwelling lots, which equals 10 units. It includes an amenity area, and it preserves the lands uh, to the south that are for the wood lot. Next, we have some slides of the potential elevations. This first one is for the semi-detached buildings They're located on the far right and south. This one is for the townhouse elevations that are on the south side. The next one includes the townhouse elevations that would be seen along one list. Next slide. This is for the public notice. Uh, residents within the 240 meter area would have received notification by direct mail with respect to this application. A notice was also provided in the Brampton Guardian and in the city of Bram and on the city of Brampton website. Next slide. So process to date, there was a previous public meeting that was held in July of 2018. Comments and delegations that were provided at the first public meeting are still part of our records and will still be held as well as obviously any uh, comments that are provided tonight. 
After the public meeting was held, the subject lands were purchased by a new owner who submitted revised application with revised supporting materials. This public meeting is now being held to address any old and or new comments as a result of the revised plans. Next slide. The official plan. The following slides will provide some of the planning policies related to this application. First, we start with the official plan. It's designated residential in the official plan. As the application meets these requirements, an amendment to the official plan is not required. Next is the secondary plan. It's located, it's sorry, it's designated low density residential in Fletcher's Meadows Secondary Plan Area 44. The proposed medium density townhouses and semi-detached development meets the intent of the density requirements of the secondary plan, and as such, an amendment is not required. Lastly, uh, the subject prior property is currently zoned agriculture, which permits agriculture purposes and a single detached dwelling. As the proposal is uh, requesting semi-detached and townhouse uh, units, there's uh, new zones that will be needed to be implemented. Next slide. Current items under review. Staff have noted some areas that require additional review prior to going forward with the report to council. Um, so there's some issues still with PSW that we're still looking at. Um, the townhouses were uh, first designed with first frontage along lawn lists. The townhouses were identified uh, are being identified as six meters and six point five meters wide. And the TIS, sorry, the traffic impact study will be reviewed and evaluated for any impacts by city staff. Finally, uh, this slide shows where staff are in the review of the application. We're now at the public meeting stage where committee and staff are here to listen to any feedback from residents. After tonight's public meeting, staff will, com uh, staff will receive the comments from all the city departments, agencies, and members of public that submitted correspondence, as well as matters that are raised at tonight's meeting. The proposal will be further assessed against the PPS, the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the Regional Official Plan, and the City's Official Plan and Secondary Plan. And once the analysis and evaluation is complete, staff will return to planning and development committee with a report. The report will address all matters raised by the public, uh, public, external agencies, and other city departments. Anyone that provided their contact information with respect to this application will be advised when the report will be considered by the committee, and ultimately the council. And once a decision is made on the application by city council, there is an opportunity to appeal the decision Planning Appeal Tribunal of the LPAD. Additional information and contacts. Report associated with tonight's meeting is available online, and the presentation will also be available online shortly. Uh, again, my name is Stephen Dykstra. My contact information is posted there. Also on screen is the contact information for Michael Danny from Western Consulting. Thank you. And the last slide is uh, leaving you off with proposed development. Thank you very much. Um, now, City Clerk, do we have any delegations? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we do. We have uh, up to six different delegations. The first will be um, a presentation by Michael Vanny from Weston Consulting. Uh, on behalf, behalf of the applicant, there is a presentation that will be brought up on the screen momentarily. And also present from the applicant is Tom Baskerville, Cost Corp Wanless Incorporated, in the event that the uh, committee may have questions at the end. And we have, after uh, Michael Vanny's presentation, uh, the next delegation will be Scott Stewart, uh, followed by Despina Spencer, John Moffat, Sanjeev Oberoi, and Vinay Chandra Gudapadu. And I'll call each of those individuals after each delegation. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Vani, you can start. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, well, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of committee, and all attendees. My name is Michael Vanny. I'm a senior planner with the Wesson Consulting Group, and I'm also joined by uh, my client, Tom Baskerville of Cost Corp Wineless, Inc., who is also tuned in and watching from home. Um, 
So I'd like to thank everyone for providing us with the opportunity to speak this evening. Uh, as most of you are aware, and as highlighted in Stephen's presentation, there was an initial public meeting held in July of 2018 by the previous applicant, which was First Urban Corporation. Um, since assuming ownership in October of 2019, Cost Corp has assumed the applications and we've been working diligently with them and a number of city staff in revising the application uh, for what's before you today. I just wanted to take a few brief moments to highlight some of the comments that were raised at the previous public meeting and just highlight some of the changes and revisions that we've made to improve the plan since the previous um, public meeting. Um, next slide, please. So some of the major items that were raised uh, at the previous meeting um, by residents and through the previous staff report was uh, firstly, the woodlot and woodland buffer located at the rear of the site. Uh, under the previous proposal, there was no buffer being proposed and all the uh, rear yards of all proposed units would have extended to the current limits of the property line. Uh, also, no lands were proposed to be rede redesignated for open space. The roadway that was previously shown was a public roadway, a 17 meter right of way that extended off of Tree Grove, and it included undersized cul-de-sac. Um, there was also no public amenity space, and there was um, insufficient, insufficient access to local parks, reduced number of walkways and access to the city's multi-use pathway along Wanless Drive. The town houses were seen to be too narrow and too close together, and they did not conform to Brampton's urban design guidelines. Um, townhouses were requested to be reverse frontage, whereas they all fronted onto the internal roadway. And the development did not meet the city's sustainability guidelines and did not offer any visitor parking. Next slide. So some of the major improvements that were made was one to the woodland buffer from the adjacent pedal woodlot. The buffer includes a 10 meter offset from the staked drip line that was staked in consultation with our ecologist and Credit Valley Conservation Authority staff. Um, the new buffer proposes a 10 meter offset from that drip line, um, which will ultimately be conveyed to the city of Brampton for its long-term protection. It will also be rezoned for open space. So that is, again, long-term protection. The woodlot will ultimately be fenced off for, from new residents and their rear yards and will not be accessible by the residents of this development. Also submitted along with this application was a woodland management plan, which proposes to plant 277 trees and 400 shrubs of native species to revitalize the buffer lands and the adjacent woodlot. Based on recommendations from our ecologist and in consultation with the Conservation Authority and Brampton staff, there have also been a number of invasive tree species that have previously been removed to protect the integrity of the woodlot. Overall, the development represents a net ecological gain. Next slide, please. Also provided based on comments from staff was that there was a lack of amenity area for being provided for this development and lack of access for future residents to adjacent parks. There were also comments that area parks were, were close to capacity. So based on those recommendations from staff, we have added a new shared amenity space for future residents of the development. It provides close and easy access to amenities and play equipment for families. Some of the items that will be included will be within the park cap will be a shade structure, play equipment, benches and tables, and will also be located adjacent to the woodlot. The communal amenity area is provided in addition to private rear yard amenity space for all of you. 30 seconds left. The revised plan uh, also included a private roads, uh, public road scenario, which has now been revised to a private road scenario, which this allows, um, this removes the previous cul-de-sac and moved it to a private road with a hammerhead configuration. This configuration has allowed us to meet peel waste standards as well as city of Brampton fire requirements. 
Also, it allows for efficient access to Tree Grove Crescent, which was recommended by City of Brampton staff and by our traffic engineer. The access to Tree Grove Crescent was previously contemplated in the previously approved uh, agreement, previously approved subdivision agreement for the adjacent lands. It does provide, uh, and there was foresight to ultimately provide access through the block to provide access to this development. Next slide, please. In addition to the improvements to the road network, we have also added a number of visitor parking spaces, 14 to be exact, as well as bicycle parking to allow visitors to the development efficient areas to park. This is in addition to the development meeting all parking requirements under the current zoning bylaw. Next slide. As mentioned previously, there has been a number of urban design additions that have been revised. The build the reverse frontage units along Wanless Drive will animate the streetscape and provide direct access for pedestrians to the multi-use path. There have also been a number of sidewalk and pedestrian walkways that have been added to connect the development to the broader uh, network. Units along Wanless Drive have also been reduced to two-story units with reverse frontages. Um, landscaping features have been added, including amenity and entry features as well to broaden and create additional vibrancy for the community. Next slide, please. So that is just a brief summary of some of the improvements that have been made to, to this development and we would, that we just wanted to highlight that were improvements that were made by um, the current applicant for the site. I'm happy to um, listen to any feedback that does that is raised this evening by any members of the public and by committee and I'm happy to answer any questions that may arise. Okay, thank you. Our next delegation. Our next delegation is Scott Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee and uh, attendees. Uh, my name is Scott Stewart. My wife Karen and I live at 46 Tree Grove Crescent. I want to thank Council for allowing me to speak regarding City File CO3W 15.008, the application to amend the zoning bylaw and plan of subdivision. Go on record as opposed to the current application. Um, now, I had some difficulty in ascertaining whether the current application is a revision to or a replacement of the original application and the applicant supporting documents and the online file combined the earlier originals along with revisions appended, making it difficult to know exactly what is currently proposed. In fact, we didn't even know that there was a new applicant. Um, thus, uh, we didn't know, did the plan ex uh, planned access road still end in a cul-de-sac, or is it now ending in a hammerhead, for example? Um, now, while some of my comments may be dated, they speak both to the original submission and to the revisions as I see them. Uh, by the way, I'm reading from my second version of my submitted documents, which uh, is somewhat less wordy. Um, density, the proposal still presents a total density target of about 30 units per hectare. And we feel this proposal tries to squeeze too much density into the area by way of utilizing some variations from official plan limits. Official and, sec official and secondary plans allow for consideration to be given for proposals that vary from housing mix and density requirements well, without an official plan amendment. But this is conditional upon satisfactory planning justification, as you know. We feel that there is not sufficient justification offered. I know the provincial uh, direction for the growth plan and PPS is for greater density and intensification within built up areas. However, this location presents some unique circumstances that would favor the original housing density envisioned for the site. The city plan for a tree growth crescent road access was drafted in anticipation of a low density development. We are concerned that approval with higher density will introduce at least an additional 53 to 106 vehicles and probably more regularly using Tree Grove Crescent as their single access to and from the planned 53 dwellings, which would pose an elevated safety risk for residents and in particular, the younger children living on Tree Grove Crescent, as well as an increased risk to property. The planned S-turn and intersection stop can induce drivers to accelerate and then speed down Tree Grove once past the bottleneck at the entrance. Children play on, pets cross, and numerous cars park on Tree Grove Crescent routinely. This could place a higher risk of liability upon the city. 
should damage, injury, or death occur partly attributable attributed to planning and approval not taking into account the risks to safety. There could be problems for access to the development by city and emergency vehicles with even more cars routinely parking curbside on tree growth and delays in clearing heavy snowfalls. This proposal comes up a bit short on required parking as submitted and we know that overcrowding of streets by parked cars is the norm rather than the exception all across the city. A wandless drive access would alleviate this problem. The submitted transportation study predicts future traffic congestion and delays, levels of service, but not for predicting road safety issues. And I am unsure whether it reflected true levels of traffic activity, being that it included only one day camera surveys at peak holiday time, and whether traffic flow simulations accounted for rush hour congestion from massive curbside parking at both the Brisdale Sugar Hill and Rambling Oak Sugar Hill intersections from parents who drive their children to the local schools on Brisdale. In any case, I would think that the majority of increased traffic flow would be to Thornbrush and then to Wanless rather than to Brisdale and Chincoozy via Sugar Hill Drive. It's the city's desire to limit access to collector roads, but we believe that changing the access to Wanless Drive would be a more logical, efficient and safer option. And we sincerely request that council consider such a change if leaning toward approval of this higher density development. As to the woodlands, there could be neg negative impacts upon the existing wetland within the petal woodlot. The city had advised the applicant, and that might be the previous applicant, that the proposed proposal and its EIS must be revised to reflect the 30 meter buffer of the provincial significant wetland with no encroachment into the natural heritage system. And it must meet the 10 meter stake drip line buffer requirement. And we couldn't see where the applicant's responses and plan changes fully adjust, uh, fully address these requirements. Infrastructure. We're concerned that tapping into the existing infrastructure from tree grow crescent for a higher density development could overtax the servicing systems. For example, there's only 150 millimeter uh, water main serving tree grove and storm runoff is also a potential concern. There could be diminished security from an influx of so many people into the block, given the relative ease of access to backyards via the protected natural woodlot. And we're also concerned about increasing the potential health risks as exhibited by the larger concentration of COVID-19 cases in the high density areas surrounding us. We sincerely hope the city heeds our concerns and ask that it reject the current version of the application. Thank you again for allowing me to speak to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Clerk, City Clerk, our next uh, delegation. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, I think Councillor Pileschi has a question of this delegation. Oh, okay, Councillor Pileschi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to the uh, delegation, uh, you had mentioned, I think, if you can remind me, you live on Tree Grove Crescent? That's correct. And are you, are you backing on directly to the subject site? Negative, we're backing on to the woodlot. You're backing onto the woodlot, and are you the uh, were you the first home uh, purchaser of that property? Yes. Yes, we were. Okay, and can I ask if you had paid a premium to back onto that woodlot? Oh yes. Okay, can you tell me what that premium was, 15, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, uh, it's his wife Karen. It was fifteen thousand dollars. Okay, thank you very much for your delegation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, you Councillor Pelushi. Um, okay, I don't see any further Sorry. questions. And uh, over to you, City Clerk, for the next uh, delegation. The next delegation is Despina Spencer. Despina, you can start, please. Hi, I'm Despina Spencer, and I live in at 44 Tree Grove Crescent with my husband and our sons. And just to be clear, we paid twenty-five thousand dollars premium to back onto the woodlot. Um, I'm also going to echo more or less everything Scott said, but I'll try and be quick and maybe stick to my more important points because he was quite clear and concise. My primary concern would be safety. When we purchased this home in 2007, we were aware that a subdivision would be built on the property. Um, we were told at the time that it would be a low density development of approximately 10 to 15 homes certainly not 53 units. Um, it's vastly different than 53 units, including medium density units that are now proposed. Um, 
53 units, like Scott said, means at least 106 cars, and we know that it's probably going to be more than that. More or less doubling, if not tripling, the vehicles that are using Tree Grove Crescent right now. And that poses a significant safety concern to the children that often, daily, are out on a quiet crescent, as they should be. I'm also concerned about what the 53 units will do to the natural heritage of the woodlot. Uh, and lastly, I'm concerned about noise and safety. As I mentioned, we paid a premium to live on this quiet crescent, and it will more or less now be a throwaway for 100 plus vehicles and who knows, 200 plus residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next delegation, uh, City Clerk. Our next delegation is John Moffitt. Please go ahead and start. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, uh, thank you, Chair, for recognizing me. I also am uh, opposed to the current motion. I live on the other side. I'm not uh, a tree grove person. I'm actually over on the other side. Uh, let, let's talk about my concerns right now. Oh, and we paid a $10,000 premium to be uh, adjacent to the wood lot. Uh, firstly, I have a challenge with uh, safety, with, specifically with fire. I know that the uh, first delegation had mentioned that everything was in accordance. However, the Ontario Building Code access route design states that um, for a fire truck to be able to get through, it must have a clear width not less than six meters. Also, that it must have a clear center line radius of not less than 12 meters. With the current S uh, design here, I don't believe that that actually would be met. Uh, we also were talking in the uh, first presentation about the transportation study. Uh, the transportation study the current one that's on file is from 2017. Um, at that time, Wanless Drive, for example, um, has added hundreds, if not thousands, of new homes. And um, what we would see not only on to Tree Grove, uh, Tree Grove to Rambling Oak, Ram Rambling Oak to Thornbush, um, you would see increased queues all the way back there. Um, even in the 2017 study, the Thornbush Wanless Drive was listed as extremely congested with wait times of 58 to 165 seconds. Adding uh, new vehicles would only exasperate that. Um, I know that it was also spoken about the R1 sustainability report. Um, I had a couple challenges with it. One said that there was a recreation center within 800 meters. The closest one is 1900 meters away. Um, I'm also concerned about the ability to handle rainfall. Um, in the original report, it said that the uh, ability to handle rainfall under five millimeters uh, was not uh, met. Also under 10 meters for extreme weather was not met. So my challenge with this be um, if with less units, uh, we weren't able to meet five millimeters, how would we do so with a greater number of units? Um, would residents be able to have flooding and sewer backup, flooding insurance as a result, especially as this is a private road now as proposed? Uh, one of the challenges with this is that with the uh, five millimeter and and uh, ten millimeter marks that we are looking at is that uh, back in 2017, 2018, um, we weren't getting as much rain. Um, in the last three days, they would have had challenges uh, because we had over five millimeters on two of the last five days. Um, in the tree evaluation report, the trees that are to be retained. Um, according to an overview of the new application, they wouldn't be all retained as they'd be directly in the pathway of new housing. Um, what was the other thing? Um, also, uh, uh, we've spoken to the uh, 30 meters from a woodlot. 
we've also spoken about the fact that the current zoning, because the houses were agricultural and they had single family houses, that we were told in our original meeting that those single family houses would make it uh, if they wish to create a new amendment, the new amendment would have to be uh, single family houses uh, adjoining the single family houses on either side of the lot, while uh, they, they could have higher density houses in the middle. I don't know how that hurdle or the uh, 30 meter uh, hurdle um, have been addressed or can be addressed. Um, I also agree with the uh, first, um, the, the third delegation, uh, where they said that uh, the documentation seems to have a mix of old and new. Uh, some of them, even the new documents, have old drawings on them. Um, so it is very confusing. We'd like to see up to date uh, information. Uh, thank you very much, Council. Thank you very much. Uh, is that it, City Clerk, or do we have one more? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we have additional delegations from uh, Sanjeev Oberoi, indicated that uh, they may wish to speak. I know they're on this call. Okay, go ahead. Hello, so Sanjeev? Maybe we go to our next delegation, Peter, and we'll uh, come back to Sanjeev. Yes, and the next delegation is uh, Vinay Chandra Gudapadu. Hello, Mr. Vinay. Through you, Mr. Chair, they seem to have left the meeting. So that is it for the delegations. And there is um, additional correspondence that uh, was noted at the beginning of the meeting. Okay, thank you. And I guess I'll go over to members of committee. If you have any uh, questions of city staff, uh, please let me know. And I do see a question from Councillor Palashi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just asking staff to uh, um, incorporate some of the um, a lot of the delegations spoke to uh, safety concerns. So I'd like, I know that, you know, when we're talking about infill sites, it's always a difficult conversation to have um, because typically it's coming to us with uh, with high density and areas that um, that were built uh, long long before and, and don't typically see this, this high of density. I'd like an opportunity for maybe, um, community safety to uh, provide comments to applications like this in the future. Um, I'd also, and I've asked this question many times before, and I'm not sure when when or what we're going to do about it, but I'm, I'm really, it's, it's upsetting to hear that so many residents have paid premium for their lots um, to be backing on, and the sale is that they're backing on to a wood lot. Um, and for most of these residents, they'll still continue to back onto a woodlot. But for a, for some of these residents, they're no longer going to be backing onto the woodlots. So it's a question that we've asked before. I really think that something needs to be done about this, where maybe maybe premiums can't be charged to 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 houses any longer. But that's for a future discussion. I'd also like to see in the staff report comments um, about the access onto Wanless. Wanless Road, Wanless Drive right now, we know, um, you know, the mayor has spoken on it, I've spoken on it, Councillor Williams has spoken on it. It's like the Indy 500, this road. So I know that we don't want, you know, we want less accesses onto Wanless, but I think the mindset needs to change with to, the, to affect the speed on this road and maybe the potential for for those turns and what we can do to access uh, more onto roads like this to try and slow down traffic instead of looking at it like it's a hazard maybe we can use this as a as a as a positive and that has a lot to do with the safety concerns um, around developments like this and, and infill sites so I, I ask that be incorporated into uh, the staff report coming back thank you mr chair i'll move receive the delegations 
Thank you, Councillor Pileschi. Um, as I see, there's no other questions. Uh, I do have a motion moved by Councillor Willens uh, to approve the staff report recommendations and Councillor Pileschi, uh, who has uh, received all related, uh, will move all related delegations and correspondence. Uh, so the motion that the report titled Information Report Applications to Amend the Zoning Bylaw in a Proposed Draft Plan of Subdivision uh, Coscor Wanless Incorporated to the Planning Development Services Committee meeting of June 22nd, 2020 be received and that Planning Development Services staff be directed to report back to the Planning Development Committee with the results of the public meeting and a staff recommendation uh, subsequent to the completion of the circulation of the application and comprehensive evaluation of the proposal. Uh, that the delegations and correspondence in regards to this item be received. Uh, to the city clerk then, uh, being that Councillor Pileschi moved the delegation correspondence, can we just add uh, that uh, Councillor Willens and Councillor Pileschi moved uh, Oh, that's motion. okay, Councillor Medeiros, whatever is easier. Yeah, okay. So we'll just put both your names there. Uh, uh, is there, Are you okay with that, Councillor Willens? Yep, I'm good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so noted. So uh, other, uh, is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. And great, there are no objections, so the motion carries. Statutory public meeting for this item is now adjourned. Item 5.3, application to amend the official plan. Uh, Havenwood Properties, north of Steeles Avenue West, Ward 4. Uh, so I will hand this over now to our uh, staff, uh, Himanshu Katyal, and my apologies for uh, the uh, mispronunciation, uh, and I'll hand it over uh, to you. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and my name is Amritial, and I am the planner assigned to process and review the application to amend the official plan, zoning bylaw, and a proposed draft plan of subdivision. Please note that the committee will not make a decision today the purpose of this public meeting is to provide information to the public and to see, seek feedback on the application. Next slide. The subject lands are located east of the financial drive and south of Camp Nyville. The nearest major intersection is Mississauga Road and Steeles Avenue. Next slide. Surrounded land, surrounding land uses include Camp Nyville to the north, existing residential uses to the west, open space to the immediate south, and natural heritage system to the east. Next slide. The applicant is proposing 300 residential units, including 155 single detached units, 56 detached units, potentially additional townhouses dependent on further environmental review, Valley land and open space block, and a public park. Next slide. The official plan designation of the property is residential and open space. The residential designation permits a broad range of residential uses that range from single detached to apartment units. The open space designation consists of both natural and cultural heritage, as well as recreational open space features. Next slide. The Bram West Secondary Plan designates the property for low medium density residential, executive residential, cluster high density residential, valley land, woodlot, and parquet. Permitted uses under the current residential designations include low, medium, and high density residential uses. The valley land and woodlot designations provide policies for the protection of natural and cultural heritage features. Next slide. The Credit Manor Heights block plan designates the lands as low density residential, executive residential, cluster high density residential, and to permit the development by reconfiguring the existing low and medium density and executive residential designations. This amendment will also remove the existing cluster and high density designation from the site 
and for, further, it will not have any effect on the lands designated open spaces. Next slide. The zoning bylaw currently permits the lands for recreational commercial uses, and the southeastern sliver of the subject lands is zoned for Next slide. The zoning bylaw amendment will permit site specific provisions to permit the proposed range of residential uses and to protect the natural heritage features. Next slide. At this time, staff has noted these issues that will need to be addressed. Clarification required on how the external drainage will be accommodated on the property. Confirmation that all proposed building lots are outside the hazardous lands. That is the meander belt of the credit river. Next slide. Prior to finalizing recommendations to council, this application will be further evaluated for consistency with the Planning Act, Provincial Policy Statement, conformity with the Growth Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the Region of Keel Official Plan, and the City of Brampton Official Plan. Next slide. Staff will continue to review the application, including reviewing comments from the public. Staff will, at a later date, advance a final recommendation report to council for a decision. Issues that have been raised will be addressed in the recommendation report. Staff will contact and follow up those residents who have provided comments through all channels. Next slide. The report and submitted materials associated with tonight's meeting is available online. The presentation will be available online shortly. If you have any questions, please feel free, please feel free to contact myself, my manager, or the applicant. Thank you. The detail is provided on this page. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any uh, delegations? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, we do. Um, first of all, Carl Brawley from Glen Schnarr & Associates and Paul Snape on behalf of the applicant uh, are present in the event there's any questions. The first delegation is from Mohammed Al-Abid, followed by Gokan Shevket, uh, Harpanit Singh, Ujjal Mondal, Harbinder Panasar, Ron Singh, and Iqbal Brar. So we'll start with Mohammed Al-Abid. You can turn on your microphone, please. Yes. Hello, folks. Um, my name is uh, Ahmed. I'm uh, Mohammed's son. He's sitting right beside me. We live in uh, 1 Alameda Street. Uh, we were the first home purchased in this neighborhood. Um, we purchased the home first in 2013. Um, so we have many concerns in, in regards to this uh, development and my father and I will be uh, speaking about this uh, briefly. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to our concerns. Um, so uh, I will start with uh, uh, with the price that was paid for, for the home. Originally when um, I remember when we attended the builder, uh, um, we were the first home to purchase um, in this neighborhood. Uh, we were uh, advised that the home uh, valuation uh, was based on uh, a number of uh, factors. Number one, the fact that this will be an executive neighborhood. So uh, this is an executive collection neighborhood. Uh, we, uh, our home is a, is a, is a 50 foot uh, but most of the homes in here are, are 70 foot in this neighborhood. Um, and the, uh, the second uh, reason why the home was evaluated, va valued at the time uh, was the fact that it backs onto uh, a woodlot and a golf course. Um, I remember, uh, actually, we have it handwritten by the sales agent. Uh, I'm looking at the paper right now. We have it handwritten by the sales agent that these uh, our home was valued at sixty thousand dollars more than other homes based on the fact that it backs onto the woodlot cool. and and the fact that it's a it's a corner house and it backs onto uh the golf course as well now uh when i look at the contract it's not broken down uh, i just see the total but i have it handwritten by the agent and i remember ex uh, very well uh, that we were advised we have to pay this premium uh, because of those reasons. So uh, our concerns uh, about the development is number one, 
um, is going to be uh, safety um, and the quality of life in the neighborhood. We currently live uh, and we were promised, you know, based on our purchase that we will be living in an executive collection neighborhood. Um, the development suggestion here, I think, is showing 30, 300 residential units. This will uh, highly compromise the quality of life in, in our neighborhood um, and also the increased traffic. Um, I mean, we have a lot of kids that are playing around in the neighborhood. The quality of air is going to be completely different. Um, number two, number, yeah, so increasing traffic. Um, so this is our, our main concern. Um, we also uh, wanted to discuss the uh, the wildlife loss. Uh, we see a lot of uh, animals in the area where uh, where uh, like uh, from deer, turkey, owls, blue jays, uh, some rare kinds of animals, uh, especially owls, woodpecker. Um, that's all loss of, of wildlife. Um, and number three, um, I'll, I'll let my dad contribute to the... Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity also. The uh, 300 houses, you can imagine the traffic influx of the 300 houses. If we calculate two cars per house, how many cars through the, will, will influx through, will move through our area? And because there is no accessibility for the uh, proposal or propose uh, a project only through our area. We have only three roads to handle this huge amount of traffic. In addition to that, if the, if the uh, proposal approved and the cost construction starts, that's mean a huge movement of uh, uh, construction machines, uh, trucks, uh, annoyance, dust, mud, all, and we just enjoy our houses. Two years ago, where the area were finished, uh, second uh, plaster coat were done. Uh, so uh, the, the, the issue here is the high intensity, high density uh, residential uh, uh, that will affect us a lot. Right, and, and uh, like just listening from the uh, earlier uh, delegation, this seems to be uh, a recurring concern here in Brampton. Um, like a lot of builders are charging the premiums. Uh, the homes are uh, uh, valued based on a certain promise. And then few a few years later, everything changes. And the, the resident has to eat up all this cost and has to go through all this inconvenience, the change of lifestyle. Um, we are here, uh, one of the most, uh, our neighborhood, uh, the executive collection neighborhood, we're one of the uh, very uh, most, like, you've never seen an organized and, and, and united neighborhood. We have a, a WhatsApp group. Uh, we're all united on when it comes to this, to this matter. We oppose uh, this project and uh, we'd like to, we'd like to look uh, we'd like to hear from you guys what you suggest. We also have a concern when it comes to the studies. We, we've we been back and forth with the planner, and we noticed that most of the studies that were used to pass the zoning bylaw um, were, were paid for by the developer. I feel like there might be a conflict of interest there because all the results were, were uh, favorable. I think there should be a third party um, mm. to, to, to verify those results. Um, I don't have anything else to add. I think the rest of the residents from the neighborhood can can uh, add. But thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much for uh, uh, your comments. And staff will uh, certainly include them uh, and keep them into consideration when they uh, prepare uh, the report. Uh, City Clerk, our next delegation. Our next delegation is uh, Gokhan Shevket. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Uh, yes. Wonderful. My name is Gokhan Shevkent, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I am actually Ahmed's, one of Ahmed's neighbors, and he did touch on a lot of the points that I was going to talk about. But, um, I just wanted to give my perspective of what we were told, independent of what I may have heard from other neighbors. 
Uh, back in 2014, my wife and I, we heavily relied on the information that was provided to us to make our decision uh, to build our dream home. And one of these decisions that we relied heavily on from the city, as well as the builder, was the fact that we were going to be living in an executive luxury home area and that the average home size that will be built into the Lionhead golf course would be approximately similar to the size of homes that we currently live in, about 4,500 square feet to about 6,000 square feet homes. And um, the second, and to me the most important to myself and my wife, would be that our lot would be backing onto a wooded lot and a ravine lot. And, you know, the premium on our lot, and we were the first 70 foot lot to purchase our home was $75,000. 75,000, I wanna repeat that. The other homes in, in, in our neighborhood on Alameda Street paid upwards of $95,000 to back onto a wooded lot. This is what the developers at the time were taunting, that this is where we're gonna be living. We didn't pay such premiums to have us fight with the city only five years later because there's some developer out there wants to maximize on their profits. You know, this is very upsetting because it seems to me both the city has to gain from the higher taxes that we pay and the developer could maximize on their profits by taunting executive luxury homes to sell homes with premiums and then to change the zoning afterwards to put in low density development and they could also advertise to the new development that there's executive homes in the neighborhood uh, and sell their um, homes to townhouses and single detached and semi-detached at higher premiums. So it's only, I, I find that it's a conflict of interest here that, that uh, developers are able to circulate misleading information knowing that there's a good possibility that these blueprints might change in the future. You know, um, there was a proposal back in 2017 that there's going to be an amendment to what was going on behind us. The strip of forest behind us was pretty much cut into one fifth. Instead of being about 100 uh, feet long, it was down to about 20 feet long, um, white, I should say. Um, so it, it would thin and, and not provide the privacy, privacy that my wife and I were strongly considering when we bought our house. So, but at least at the time, back in 2017, when this proposal was presented to our community, it was still low density dwelling. Now, just about two months ago, or maybe about a month ago, this proposal was switched. It looks very similar from someone who's observing from a distance. It looks very similar, but now they switched the proposal from low density to high density, including semi-detached, and, and townhouses pretty much quadrupled the number of homes in the neighborhood and and they got rid of the forest. So someone who's not very observant could see this proposal and not realize that it's been substantially changed by, by the developer. And I find that very disturbing. Now I did my own research and it, to me, the proposal that is currently on the table um, with the semi-detached and the townhomes were actually drafted back in 2017 before the proposal that was presented to us in December 2017. So to me, the, there seems to be a lot of misinformation uh, to dilute and, and confuse the neighbors so that there isn't um, a position to this development that's going to, that's going to go ahead. You know, I'm also a biologist specialist, and uh, I, I do. I, I one of my hobbies is to watch birds, and I have observed uh, barn owls. I have observed endangered woodpeckers. I'd be happy to list the species for you, but I, I, I'm sure most of you are not familiar with it, so I won't waste my time doing that. But 
I think it's very important that these creatures are taken into consideration before we just, you know, clear cut the forest to make room for these, uh, you know, high density homes. There needs to be repercussions to prevent developers from changing these proposals because they maximize in their profits when they sell lots with premiums. People are willing to pay these premiums because they love nature. They love low density dwellings. And, and to have this change afterwards, I, I find, you know, this is not fair. And our neighbors, our neighborhood is so livid. We are willing to take legal action against the city and the developers if need be. This is all I have to say. I did have an attachment that I had emailed um, uh, the council. I don't know if that's available to have a look, but you could gradually see what was presented to us in 2014, open space behind our house, and what is current and, and the gradual change from what was presented in 2017 and to what it is right now. And that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you uh, very much. And again, as a reminder, no decision is uh, being made tonight uh, um, as part of uh, which has been outlined uh, at the beginning. Uh, we're taking all the comments and certainly staff will take your comments into consideration uh, when we draft uh, the report. So I thank you. Uh, our city clerk, could we have uh, uh, another uh, delegation? Yes, through you, Mr. Chair, it's Harpanit Singh. Please go ahead. Yes, hi, good evening. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Sorry, apologies, I had my microphone on. Uh, so first of all, thank you for letting me speak. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak. Uh, and uh, I, like some of my colleagues and neighbors, uh, you know, oppose this new uh, plan that's being put forward by the builder. And uh, I echo some of the sentiments uh, shared earlier by uh, the colleagues and neighbors. But my main concerns, I live on the Sacramento Road, by the way, and uh, I think the proposal, the new proposal is uh, advising that the Sacramento Road is going to be extended. So my main concerns are with the number of houses being built and the traffic, and which is going to lead with, uh, you know, traffic safety and also, you know, depletion uh, depletion of the uh, environment and biodiversity in the area so i live on an intersection close to the school uh, it's an elementary school uh, i myself have had two young children and um, I, I notice you know every time you know when the school is on a lot of parents or you know people dropping their kids you know they park illegally you know during school time you know on the on the uh, financial road and with the initial you know uh, uh, number of houses being proposed you know I don't think we have enough uh, school in the area, you know, or these spots, you know, for people to bring their kids safely to school. So that's one of my main concerns, you know. Where are people going to park, you know, how are they going to bring their kids to schools and, you know, how are they going to have, you know, a decent flow of traffic, you know, without uh, uh, causing any issues in the area. So so that's, that's one. And then, of course, you know, like... Uh, uh, some of the colleagues have said, you know, uh, the natural biodiversity is another concern. Um, I, I think there's a lot of natural uh, flora and fauna in the area. There's a lot of mature trees, you know, uh, and uh, I think if we if we cut those trees, you know, it, it takes, as everyone knows, you know, quite a number of years, you know, to have the, that kind of growth back. Uh, I, I think in general, the number of trees being planted by the current builder is, is inadequate. I mean, if you walk around in the neighborhood uh, during daytime you know you'll see a lot of sun you hardly see any shade because there's no mature trees and the good part is you know we have some good trees uh you know where people like to take walks on the trails you know and uh, there's greenery you know the golf course and everything and uh, we were promised you know as we when we bought these homes that these are executive homes and the homes that will come in the future will be all executive homes so again the main concern is you know the number of homes uh, that are being built and uh, also to echo, you know, like um, there's a lot of elderly in the neighborhood as well. And I think, you know, it's it's not a unknown fact, you know, that um, there's there's the driving concerns, you know, in the Brampton. But I, mean, I know that's not part of this conversation, but the concern I want to bring up is I see a lot of elderly, you know, walking with, you know, uh, help of uh, prosthetics, you know, or, you know, with the help of, uh, you know, 
um, artificial, you know, um, chairs and whatnot, right? To to be in the neighborhood, kids playing, you know, basketball, you know, and, and so forth. So if Sacramento Road is is home to a lot of young kids and elderly, you know, walking in the evening, and I think with the 600 plus, you know, cars that's going to be zooming in and out of the area, I think that's a that's a major concern. As Gokul was saying earlier, I think the initial plan that was submitted before this one that had, I think, a perpendicular uh, wooden belt so the Sacramento Road wouldn't be extended. But I think with the Sacramento Road being extended all the way to Credit View, this is going to become a major highway, you know, and people are going to be zooming past. So I, I think that's a, that's a big uh, safety concern uh, that I want to bring up as well. Uh, and uh, I have also emailed uh, to the counselor, I think, some of my other concerns. So. I'll, I'll rest my case here, but uh, thank you for giving me the time and opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, uh, City Clerk. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the next delegation was to be Ujjal Mondal, who had submitted a presentation, but uh, um, Ujjal did not join the call this evening, so I recommend that his presentation slides just be received as correspondence with this item. And then after okay. that, we have Harbinder Panasar. Harbinder, please go ahead. Harbinder, you can just unmute your microphone. Here, I'll assist you here. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, Harbinder. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, we used to live on the south side of uh, uh, Steeles Avenue, and uh, we saw the houses coming up here because of all the trees in the back. And we moved to 13 Sacramento about uh, four years ago. We were very happy because we see all the trees on the uh, at the back of our house and also on the side. Uh, but you know, we just uh, saw this amendment. We were told that there's nothing coming in the future. So you know, this is the um, you know the best purchase. We paid premium as all my colleagues did in, in our neighborhood. And now we are right on Sacramento and, you know, uh, close to the um, uh, golf course. Major concern is the traffic on the road. And as Harry and, uh, uh, and everybody else in our community has said that there are a lot of children playing. I see children playing on the road. There's a school nearby, um, you know, so lot of elderly people walking on the street. This is going to be really busy uh, with 300 houses. It's going to be extremely busy area. So it's very, very upsetting because we paid premium to the builder as well. And uh, we thought this is the dream. And you know now everything is changing. So I think you know they need to rethink uh, all the grindy uh, is going to be lost as Muhammad. He's very like, you know, it's right behind his house close to our house and uh, that's my request you know to rethink about this proposal thank you okay thank you very much city clerk um through you mr chair i believe councillor santos may have a question okay so we have no more delegations and yes i will acknowledge uh, as a reminder to members of the committee uh you can use the chat function in webex to add your name to the speakers list so i do see councillor santos go ahead Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of the delegates for the feedback this evening. Um, we are challenged with some uh, growth tar uh, targets set by the province. Um, and so as we continue to develop, uh, obviously your feedback is important. But I do have a, a question. Um, the, the properties, the established properties that are adjacent to this new development, what was on that land before those houses were developed? Before, before all, the delegates who are who are delegating, who live in the area surrounding the new development, what what was there before? Can we ask the council? Okay. It's a question to staff. Just clarification: what was what was in that particular area before the other houses were developed? surrounding the new development proposal. 
through through you, Mr. Chairman, this is Alan Parsons here, Director of Development Services at the City of Brampton. Councillor Santos, uh, really prior to the development of the adjacent established community, the, the lands there would have likely been either other green land uh, by way of agricultural land or early fallow land. So I don't, can't confirm either way, but uh, uh, it's it's likelihood there's like likelihood that it was agricultural land used for active agriculture at that time. Okay, so so thank you for uh, that comment. And then there were also comments about uh, builder or builder um, premiums, etc. And, and I can totally understand uh, why residents would be upset about the previous premiums that they paid uh, for the woodlot behind them. Do, do do those developers or builders normally indicate in the fine print as to what conditions are? Because I can't imagine that if if we were bound by those uh, numbers set out by the builder or developer that we'd be able to even proceed um, with this proposal, if someone can clarify. Through you, Mr. Chairman, through to Councillor Santos, uh, Alan here again. So I can't comment on the specifics here in this case, but uh, in a general sense, uh, staff is not uh, really part of the, the conversation as home builders are providing uh, really requirements for premiums through to new home purchasers. Uh, typically, they'll just be acting on their own with respect to uh, identifying to the prospective purchasers what the planning is for the surrounding area and where there is instances that the, the, the surrounding planned uses uh, around each of the lots are maybe seen as being uh, advantageous to a, a serene lifestyle, lifestyle and such. Uh, they, they typically will, will add some uh, premium requirements for those lots. Okay, thank you. Um, and so I would suggest that because the city um, can't really do anything regarding uh, the premiums that were previously paid when, when uh, some of the delegates were deciding to purchase the property that would have existed on agricultural land or woodlotted land, who knows what land was there before. Um, but in any case, like I understand the frustration, the challenge we have is, is the growth that we have to accommodate in the city of Brampton. So um, I, I, I totally um, uh, have compassion for the owls and the woodpeckers uh, that folks are concerned about. I'm an environmentalist myself, um, but keep in mind that before uh, some of the folks who now live there lived there, uh, there were also some endangered species uh, and other animals that existed on the province on the property that you now reside on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Santos. Uh, City Clerk, I've received a. Um, a request by a resident to speak. Uh, it's a Mr. Ron Singh. Yes, my apologies, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I misunderstood when Councillor Santos had a question. I thought it was for the last delegation. There is one more speaker who is Ron Singh, and he is on the line to uh, Mr. Singh. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Th thank you, councillors. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the, the, the time to, to speak with regards to this project. I just want to make a comment here before I before I, I go on. And that's to Councillor Santos is, you know, I understand that the city has the uh, demands in order to meet growth uh, and population growth, uh, growth within the city. But I think the plans really need to be reconsidered in terms of what the impacts it does to residents who have already purchased homes, who are already raising families in these in in, uh, in these uh, executive uh, communities, where we bought our homes for a high for for uh, for I, w I wouldn't say cheap, but we bought our homes and we're till today we're paying we're we're paying for these homes and we're paying for these premiums that uh, that that we have paid. And to answer your questions around fine prints that were in these contracts, I am I am very open and I I could show you my contract. And even in fact that our street was was uh, supposed to be a street that will not be extended and we had to sign for it because we're not able to make uh, any left turns from our street and that's Porto Paulo. So please take that into uh, into consideration. So today uh, today is my uh, my uh, the, the reason why I'm speaking is again I I'm against this project that's being that's being uh, developed uh, right on 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 the property of of Lionhead. When we bought our home, we one of the selling features was that we we are backing on to a golf course and 
onto and onto this wooden lot. Uh, this project here has outlined that there will be 300 new homes built in this area. This is resulting in a whole new population in conjunction in, into our area. It's adding 300 homes in the designated space. It's going to cause an influx of residents, vehicles, and traffics in the area. The luscious green, the green space that everyone's been talking about in this area will not be taken away and houses will be crammed into, into this space. It's not going to look like an executive community that we were promised. Furthermore, the addition of these homes means that there will be an expansion of roads, which will lead to an increased number of vehicles uh, in, in the neighborhood. With so many children and having two daughters of, of my own, five, five and three years old, this will lead to an increased number of, of, of vehicles into our neighborhood. With so many children and elderly in the neighborhood, this is increased traffic, which will cause a huge impact to, to families. It will be no longer to, to, to be safe for children to walk and play outside or elderly to walk as traffic will be so busy. As already we have such a busy traffic problem in Brampton and unable to control our own traffic. Cami Drive currently has no cars going through this, but this will result in this neighborhood having significant cars going through. Again, decreasing safety in the neighborhood as you hear that over and over and over again. With the school that is in walking distance, which is one of the reasons why I purchased my property here, as well with the greenery and, and the golf course, many families walk to and from school and children also walk to and from school alone. The increased cars will make it will make it uh, will not make it safe for these children to walk through the increased population also forces a share of resources part of the sell of these homes and the reason for that people have paid such high prices for, uh, for the homes as you've heard about these premiums that 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 we pay was for the heritage land and the beautiful natural landscape surrounding the homes all this natural scenery trees forests and animals will be removed it is a huge hit to the environment as well as to the beauty of the neighborhood Adding these homes in this area will devalue the current properties and the neighborhood will no longer have the greenery and natural uh, spaces that, that we have. It will just be a construction zone and will be vibrations and heavy machine, machinery being around will cause pollution and potential house damage to all of the existing properties. Why does every scenery that Brampton have need to be filled with homes? 300 homes are going to be be compacted, fit into an area, and devalue our property values. The current homes currently right now here are luxurious homes with 50, 60, and 70 foot lots, ranging between 3,500 to 6,000 square foot. And people have spent a lot of money to purchase these executive estates. People enjoy the natural sounds and peacefulness of, of, the, of the nature. Families enjoy sitting in their backyards and watch the birds, squirrels, rabbits, I'm not gonna name all the animals that we see. With the construction and addition of all these homes, all these animals will be displaced and removed from their natural ha habitat. Again, the quiet, calm neighborhood will be replaced, will be disruptive with construction noise and pollution, and not to mention the consistent rerouting and mess that, that will cause. People, again, like I mentioned, have spent so much money upgrading their homes and getting landscaping done to, to their premises. With the construction of these 300 plus homes will be a consistent dirt and pollution in the area and it will just be construction zone with the vibration and heavy machinery being around, causing pollution and damage to our homes. Who's going to pay for all of these? Properties will be covered in dust and debris or dirt. Again, people did not purchase million dollar homes to live in a construction zone. We paid the money that we paid to enjoy our homes. People purchased these homes because they wanted a beautiful and natural environment surrounding the homes and a quiet neighborhood. They wanted peace in a close-knit committee, which we all are, not busy traffic area. Our request is to please carefully reconsider this project and not transform this beautiful and peaceful neighborhood into a cookie-cutter, busy neighborhood with houses topping one another. Not turn into a neighborhood into a construction zone and devalue our properties that we have paid so much for. Please think of the beautiful forest and wildlife in the area. Also, you know, uh, that's 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 it on my end. I'm on. I I live on on, on Fort Hope Hollow. That comment that was made around, uh, you know, uh, around that we have to, we have to increase our population and we have to take the for. And I don't think you have, when you have to increase the population, you need to take forests and you take natural beauty out of uh, out of people's backyards. So please reconsider this project. 
Thank you again, Mr. Singh. And uh, as one of your area councillors, along with uh, Councillor Bowman, uh, do understand that uh, tonight again is a statutory public meeting. Uh, tonight, a decision is not made. Uh, and second, um, the city does not have recourse to uh, stop people from bringing forth applications. So this is part of a process. Uh, and tonight is not about uh, uh, you know, us taking a position. Uh, all your comments, uh, and I see that the community is uh, passionate. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, um, you know, real good comments, and staff will take this uh, under consideration when they develop a recommendation report at that time, which we make a decision. Uh, so, again, tonight, I appreciate all the comments, uh, but do understand that myself and Councillor Bowman, uh, uh, tonight is about listening. Uh, and these comments are uh, put forth in uh, uh, in a report that will come later to council. Uh, so, uh, City Clerk, as I see, there's no further delegations, and uh, I do not see any further questions uh, or comments from uh, members of committee. Uh, I have a motion uh, moved by Councillor Bowman to approve the staff report recommendations and delegations and correspondence. Uh, that the report titled Information Report Application to Amend the Official Plan uh, Zoning Bylaw and Proposed Draft Plan of Subdiv uh, Subdivision Glen Sharn Associates, uh, Havenwood uh, Properties, East of Financial Drive and North of Steeles Avenue West, Ward 4, uh, be received, and that Planning and Development Services staff be directed to report back to the Planning and Development Committee with the results of the public meeting and a staff recommendation. Uh, subsequent to the completion of the circulation of the application, a comprehensive evaluation of the proposal, uh, that the delegations and correspondence in regards to this item be received. Uh, is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you. There are no objections, so the motion carries. The statutory public meeting for this item is now adjourned. Our next item is item 5.4 uh, regarding Block 102, uh, south side of Financial Drive, west of Mississauga Road. So I will hand this over to Kelly Henderson, uh, uh, Development Planner, Planning and Development Services. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, committee members, and members of the public. My name is Kelly Henderson, and I'm the planner assigned to process and review this application. The purpose of this public meeting is to provide information to the public and seek feedback on the application filed by Glenn Schnarr and Associates on behalf of Knef Properties. Next slide, please. The subject property is located on the south side of Financial Drive, west of Mississauga Road, and within Ward 6. Next slide, please. The property is currently vacant and is surrounded by residential uses and a woodlot. It is approximately 3.63 acres in size and has a frontage of approximately 142 meters along Financial Drive. The applicant has submitted an application for a zoning bylaw amendment to permit 93 story stack townhouses as a permitted use together with the corresponding provisions of the current R3C-2435 zone. The entire development is proposed as a residential condominium with vehicular access to Financial Drive through an internal private road. Next slide, please. Knef Properties Limited initially submitted an application to amend the official plan and zoning bylaw for the subject property on July 28, 2014. A public meeting for that application was held on December 8, 2014. At that time, the application proposed a five-story form of stacked townhouses and applied to two separate parcels along the south side of Financial Drive. The applicant withdrew this application and developed the lands to the east and changed the proposal to the application we have before us today. Next slide, please. This map is showing the property owners within a 240 meter limit of the proposed development who would have received notice by direct mail with respect to the application. Notice was also provided in the Brampton Guardian newspaper and the City of Brampton website. Next slide, please. The property is designated residential on Schedule A of the official plan. An official plan amendment is not required to prevent the proposed use. Next slide, please. The current secondary plan designates the subject property as medium density. In the Bram West secondary plan, an amendment to the secondary plan is not required. Next slide, please. The subject land is zoned residential townhouse C, section 2435. This zone permits townhouse dwellings. The zoning bylaw amendment is required to permit the proposed form of townhouse dwellings being stacked townhouses. Next slide, please. 
Comments from staff and external commenting agencies are required in order to provide a complete comprehensive analysis for this application. Through staff's preliminary review of the application, there have been a few issues identified, being urban design and site layout, and how to best integrate the proposed development within the existing neighborhood and ensure compatibility with the surrounding land uses. These issues and any other matters identified through the processing of this application will be addressed in a future recommendation report. Next slide, please. We are now at the public meeting stage where committee members and staff are here to listen to any feedback from residents. After tonight's public meeting, staff comments received from any city departments, agencies, members of the public that submitted correspondence as well as matters raised at tonight's meeting through the public delegations will be reviewed and evaluated. The proposal will be further assessed against provincial, regional, and the city's plans. Once the analysis and evaluation is complete, staff will return to planning and development committee with a recommendation report. The recommendation report will address all matters raised by members of the public, external agencies, and other city departments. Anyone that provided their contact information with respect to this application will be advised when the recommendation report will be considered by the committee. Once a decision is made on the application by city council, there's an opportunity to appeal the decision to the local planning appeal tribunal. Next slide, please. The report associated with tonight's meeting is available online and the presentation will be available online shortly. Again, my name is Kelly Henderson and my contact information is posted on the screen as well as the contact information for the applicant. Thank you and this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, City Clerk, do we have delegations tonight? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we have a video delegation which we'll be playing momentarily and also with us is Jason Afonso from Glen Shenard Associates and Paul Snape representing the applicant. And we're just going to bring up the video presentation. We're just trying to get the sound working. Hi, thank you for taking the time to listen to my uh, video. Um, Sorry, I couldn't change under my scrubs. I don't think I was going to make the deadline, so I just uh, decided to do the video as is. Um, I just had a few points that I, I wish for you to consider or think about um, regarding this new development. Um, one is, uh, I think everybody who was in the phase three of ours knew that there was going to be further development beside us, but it was to be detached homes and estate homes and the volume and traffic um, and, and the impact to the neighborhood wouldn't be as uh, extensive as now the amendment, which includes 300 plus homes, which is not just, a, a, it's not just more homes. It's, it's a brand new neighborhood that's being built that was originally slated to be just additional homes to be in that area. And um, so that's why I disagree with the amendment. So one of the things is I wanted to know is, did we do a study about the impact on the schools? Right now, El Dorado Park, um, which is the school um, that this um, new neighborhood would filter to, already has a thousand plus pay, uh, uh, students uh, at the school. And it's already a very small field. Um, I think the developers and ours did not um, leave enough land for that school to begin with. It already has portables. So if you have 300 homes coming in, I'm not sure how you'll accommodate the students and you can't really put more portables into that field. Maybe if you get a chance to go look at the lay of the land of that school, there isn't any land print to put more portables without really shortchanging the children's um, uh, experience from an outdoor activity point of view. The other thing is, and if you can take a look back at the plans, it just doesn't make sense from an urban planning point of view. Normally, from looking at homes in the Brampton area, our neighborhoods in the Brampton area, you go from high density to low density. So you'll have the towns on the outside, semis, detached, and then the larger estate homes in the middle. That's exactly how the layout of our, our neighborhood is. But now this new extension, which was supposed to be estate homes, has turned into a 300 uh, uh, home development, which has gone from exactly what I described from towns to semis to detached to estates now back to towns um, just from a logistical point of view it just doesn't make sense to me why the urban planning would want to go in that direction another point was the traffic um, 
I sound like a broken record, but again, when you're going from estate homes, which is much lower density homes to 300 plus dwellings, you're going to have much more traffic. All those homes would have to travel, all those homes would have to exit through residential streets. And those residential streets are quiet, detached home streets. Not sure if the, the developer has thought of the fact that all those people have to flow through these quieter, detached home streets. These aren't thorough streets. Is there any plan by the developer to make new access points to Mississauga Road? I don't know how you plan to funnel 300 homes through residential, not even residential, but quiet home streets. So is that in plan? Because I don't see if their studies were done, how they're accurate to see that the traffic would be accommodated based on what I see on the boards and the plan. To conclude, I just want to make it clear, this is not a complaint that why is there homes being built? I think everybody in phase three knew that there was going to be homes being built and everybody knew that when they built the, bought their homes. The problem is that there's an, a new amendment that's being put in place that's drastically changing what the original plan was. The original plan was that all detached homes, estate homes, to a multi-dwelling 300 plus uh, neighborhood in a place that was slotted for just a handful of homes. Um, the impact on traffic, schooling, and just urban design and plan doesn't make sense to me. So please take some time to to um, um, address the points that I made here. And um, and again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and first of all, uh, uh, I think it's been the first time I've ever had a frontline worker give a delegation. And certainly uh, we do notice that he's uh, doing it from a place of work and, and our full uh, uh, respect uh, um, goes out to him uh, uh, for taking time uh, during a very difficult period to express his opinion. I do see that there are notes, uh, City Clerk, if you can confirm that this video delegation actually was for item 5.3 and not item 5.4. For you, Mr. Chair, the information I had is it, it did apply to 5.4, but we will verify that and make sure it aligns with the appropriate item on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will go to our next delegation. Uh, uh, City Clerk, you said there was another one? That, that is it. Uh, we have the uh, applicants' representatives here. If there's any questions, other than that, that's the only video delegation for this item, 5.4. Okay, are there any questions from... Uh, members of committee. Uh, no, okay. So I do believe then I have a motion moved by Councillor Palashi to approve the staff report recommendations uh, that the report titled Information Report um, can have properties Block 102 and Block 127 West of Mississauga Road, Ward 6, dated May 9th. Uh, to the Planning Development Committee meeting of June 22, 2020 be received. That Planning Development Services staff be directed to report back to the Planning Development Committee with the results of the public meeting and a staff recommendation subsequent to the completion of the circulation of the application and comprehensive evaluation of the proposal that the delegations and correspondence in regard to this item be received. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you. There are no objections, so the motion carries. The statutory public meeting for this item is now adjourned. Uh, we go to our next staff report, item 5.5, application to amend the zoning bylaw, uh, 50 Wentworth Court, Ward 8. Uh, and uh, I hand this over to Cynthia, please. Thank the, you. Uh, yep, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and members of the public. My name is Cynthia Owusujima, and I'm the planner assigned to process this zoning bylaw amendment application. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to hear submissions from the public, present the information regarding this proposal. A decision on the application will not be made tonight. Uh, recommendation report will be considered by a committee at a future meeting, and a decision will be made at that time. The application was submitted by Ganyon Walker Domes Limited on behalf of a number company. Next slide, please. So the uh, application proposed is for zoning bylaw amendment, and this is to permit a concrete biochain plant on the property at uh, 50 Wenwen Court. 
which is currently being used for a surface uh, parking lot for oversized vehicles. Next slide, please. The subject location, site is located in the southeast part of Brampton at 50 Wenwell Court. Um, the major intersection would be Galway Drive and it's north of Highway 407. Next slide. So at the larger uh, contest, the site is uh, next, right next to Clever Conservation Area, which is to the east of the site, and the Canadian, Canadian Tire Distribution Center uh, on Galway, just to give you a point of reference. Next slide. The uh, surrounding uses around the site are primarily industrial and includes mostly waste transfer stations, recycling uh, centers, concrete batching, and some strata and aggregate um, uses. Next slide, please. So the subject site is designated industrial in the official plan. This designation permits predominantly industrial uses, including manufacturing, distribution, commercial, self-storage, as well as some limited service, retail, and office uses. Uh, an official plan amendment is not required for the proposed development. Next slide. The site is located within the Gore Industrial South Secondary Plan Area. And again, it's also in des designated industrial in this secondary plan. And this designation permits similar uses as I've outlined in the official plan. Next slide. The zoning for the site is also industrial and this industrial zone permits manufacturing, cleaning, packaging, processing, um, warehousing, and um, an amendment to the zoning bylaws required to permit a concrete batching plant uh, on the site. Next slide. So through the review of the application, an issue that has been identified on a preliminary basis is to ensure that should the application be approved, there are no negative impact on the adjacent natural um, areas, which is Clearview, Clairville Conservation Area. Next slide. So to review the planning application, staff have to do a thorough analysis and ensure that the proposal will meet all the necessary planning framework by the province and also the regional official plan and the city's official plan. So those are the documents that staff will be using to review the application. Right now, we are at the public meeting stage. So as my some of my colleagues have said already, there's no decision to be made at this time. A notice was sent out to uh, anybody within 240 meters of the site, and a notice was also placed in the Brampton Guardian. Um, at the moment, we are still reviewing the application. We will continue to collect comments from the public, from internal staff and external agencies. At a future date, when the review is complete, staff will forward a recommendation report to Planning Development Committee. At that time, the report will address any comments uh, concerns that have been raised at, at that time, and the decision will be made at that time. There will also be a follow-up letter that will be sent to the public or anybody who has uh, put their name forward as having an interest in the application. Next slide. So I'm the planner on the file. That's my contact information on the slide. If you have any questions or comments, please give me a call. Uh, reach out to me uh, through email, preferably these days. And um, the applicant is Mark uh, Denaris from Ghana Walker Domes, who can also be contacted. And that concludes the tonight's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, members of the committee, again, you can use your chat function WebEx. I see that there are no uh, questions or comments. So I have a motion moved by Councilor Fortini to approve the staff report recommendations and receive all related correspondence at the report titled Information Report, um, Gagnon Walker Domes, 51 Fourth Court, Ward 8, to the Planning Development Committee meeting of June 22nd, 2020 be received. That Planning Development Services staff be directed to report back to the Planning Development Committee with the results of the public meeting and the staff recommendation subsequent to the completion of the circulation of the application, a comprehensive evaluation of the proposal that the correspondence in regard to this item be received. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you, there are no objections, so the motion carries. We now go on to item 6.1, delegations. Uh, our next item is regarding a public notice 
uh, was issued by the city regarding site-specific amendments to the sign bylaw, and this relates to staff reports 8.1 and 8.2. Uh, in place of in-person delegations, written delegations are accepted regarding this matter. I will ask the city clerk if there are any written delegations submitted regarding this public notice. Through you, Mr. Chair, there are not. Okay, seeing none, we can move on to the next business item and we'll deal with that item in agenda order. Uh, otherwise, uh, okay. And uh, item 6.2 we addressed. Um, our next item, the delegation was addressed as part of statutory public media item 5.2. Our next item is 6.3, a delegation from uh, Ryan Guter, Weston Consulting regarding staff report item 8.3. Welcome, Ryan. You have five minutes for your delegation. Sorry, Mr. Chair. He's just um, being entered into the meeting now. Hello there. Uh, Ryan, your mic is, is open. Please go ahead. Well, good afternoon, evening, uh, members of the committee, Mr. Chair. Ryan Guter here. What you have on the screen are some notes. Um, I intend to speak very briefly to this matter uh, and I'm available to answer any questions of the committee. Um, you have before you uh, item 8.3, which is a staff report. And just for some context, uh, Weston Consulting is the planning consultant for Sunfield Investments uh, Church Inc. And this is in relation to a matter that is for proposed development within the Brampton Flowerton secondary plan. And this request is uh, accompanied by a, a, a staff report that is uh, outlining two recommendations uh, of the committee. And the proposed uh, development is uh, occupying lands about 0.3 hectares of area and fronting directly onto Church Street. And the there's been a series of pre-consultation uh, meetings that have taken place for proposed development that is comprised of a total of 29 townhome units. And what we're seeking uh, as, as set out in the staff report is due to the um, uh, two year period in which the Flowerton secondary plan was adopted, uh, we're seeking relief from the provisions of the Planning Act that would prevent uh, us from filing an official plan amendment to that secondary plan. And um, ultimately the desire would be to have uh, the committee ultimately in council, uh, if the wish of the committee is to accept the staff recommendation that the, the matter be granted, uh, allowing us to be exempt from the two year moratorium. And very simply, uh, that would not be rendering any decisions on the merits of the application, but would simply be an allowance for us to make the applications to the city or an official plan amendment. And we do believe uh, as set out in our submissions and in the staff report there to be merit in the request um, and obviously that's outlined in my uh, deputation notes i don't intend to uh, go through them line by line but uh, um, essentially to highlight that uh, we do believe there's merit in the justification for this exemption and would support the staff recommendations and with uh, your indulgence mr chair and members of the committee um, i'm here to answer any questions that may arise but again I would support the staff recommendations contained uh, in the staff report item uh, 8.3 and uh, as such those recommendations would allow us to in fact make an application that would be filed uh, separately to the city and uh, we believe uh, that that's appropriate and would certainly ask for the committee's support. Um, I would just simply highlight as well that um, this proposed development obviously would run its course through a public process and a very detailed and comprehensive assessment under the Planning Act. And again, with those remarks, um, uh, here to answer any questions of the committee and thanks for the opportunity to address you this evening. Uh, yes, go ahead, City Clerk. Uh, no, I don't have anything to add, Mr. Chair. Oh, okay, my apologies. Uh, so I don't see any questions or comments anyone on the board and I do have a motion, a motion moved by Councillor Santos to approve the report recommendations and receive the delegation uh, that the staff report titled request for an exemption 
uh, from Section 22 2.11 of the Planning Act to allow an application to amend the Brampton Flower Town Secondary Plan Area 6 to be submitted that will facilitate the development of 26 back to back townhouse units and three standard condominium townhouse units, Sunfield Homes, Weston Consulting, 172 Church Street East, Ward 1, to the Planning Development Committee meeting of June 22, 2020, be received. That Council exempt the secondary plan amendment application at 172 Church Street East from Section 22 2.11 of the Planning Act that the delegation from Ryan Gutter Weston Consulting be received. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you. There are no objections, so the motion carries. Our next item is uh, 6.4, delegation from Harpreet Sidhu and Yuvraj uh, China, and it's regarding uh, item 8.4. Uh, so I will invite now Harpreet and Yuvraj uh, to speak regarding the, uh, uh, about the facade improvement grant, 12 Church Street East, east of Main Street North, on the north side of Church Street East, Ward 1. Welcome, Harpreet and Yuvraj. You have five minutes for your delegation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and good evening to everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, so there was a presentation. Yep. So um, we are a law firm located at 12 Church Street East. Um, uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and we purchased the property in 2015, uh, but it's, I'm sorry to say that ever since we moved here with our law firm, it's been only a disaster. Um, this is not the first time 12 Church Street has been on the city's agenda. I've been before a number of you and previous councillors um, since 2015 to date. Um, in a nutshell, there has been 10 plus police reports that have been documented that were also submitted with my presentation, about 55 pages. So uh, you can review those at your uh, leisure. And then uh, there were about 50 plus incidences at the property. So this slide is basically a summary um, of what led us to the facade improvement and the changes that we had to make to ensure that one, our property was safe. Um, so you'll see the damage on the first column. Um, we had broken security cameras, uh, lights. We had a fire at the property. Uh, there's regular debris, condoms, needles. We find every day drugs, garbage, um, baby strollers, clothes. So we, leave, we, we come to the office at 9 a.m. We're, we're a small law firm. Uh, there's two lawyers and then we have like one or two support staff. Um, every day when we come in the morning, we have to essentially clean up the property first uh, or there's somebody sleeping. On, at the front of the property, um, it's very disturbing, and it's and it's very, um, it's just very gross to be honest. Um, we had broken prop, uh, broken a broken deck, uh, squatters, uh, regular prostitution, um, soliciting our clients uh, for services, um, animal infestation just due to the garbage that's left overnight. So um, and just the cost associated with that, like we're a small firm, and the number. The number of dollars that we've had to put in to ensure that our business is running is has been in, like it's been paramount. Um, we we can't retain staff. Uh, people refuse to work at our firm, uh, and, and the law firm across the street has the same problem. And largely because, um, especially during the winter months, people don't want to stay after six because it gets late, and then they get uh, approached for uh, services or things like that. Uh, cleaning costs, just loss of reputation of being on Church Street. Uh, we've we've had to call the city a number of times for hazmat, so for needle cleanup to get the equipment, to put gloves and the appropriate equipment on to clean up the needles. Um, so we've basically spent, all, like I would say, close to $50,000 just out of pocket, just to ensure that the property is uh, stable and it's safe, uh, which is our biggest concern. Uh, the impact, which you'll see on the side, we've had 50 plus incidents, 20 plus incidents we've handled ourselves. So we've, uh, you know, asked trespassers to leave. We've cleaned up the property. Um, we've tried to fix stuff that's been broken. Um, there's been 20 plus incidents where PO police were involved, um, especially on uh, the bicycles and the street patrol. And there, were, there are 10 plus official police reports that were conducted, uh, which were documented and um, submitted to council about the incidences that took place. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
Um, so this is a timeline of events. Uh, the reference numbers at the top show the official police reports. So you'll see that we purchased the property in October 2015. Um, and then what led us to the facade uh, application was because there was a property jam damage and a fire. So we have a lattice fence um, up front porch and people would rip off the lattice fence, fence and crawl underneath. And one day after five o'clock, we got a call from our neighbor saying that your porch is on fire. Um, and we quick, we don't, we don't live in Brampton um, and we live in Aaron actually. So we, we drove all the way from Aaron uh, to rush to our property and then official police report was filed. So then that's what led us to the facade application. Um, our neighbor on Church Street advised us that we could, this, we could, this was something that could help in our um, improvement. Um, and then we went through various steps to go with designs um, with, the, with the city and you'll see the timelines. Um, eventually, we, we got to a design in December 2017, and then at that point, we only we could only afford to go forward with the pot lights because there was no lighting. Um, so we thought the first most paramount thing uh, for safety is to is to light up the property. So it's so just for safety, and that that way it would deter people people from sleeping there or hanging out there. And it's not just one or two people; it's like gangs of ten or fifteen. Um, there was many times when we had to stop like really embarrassing activity from going on at the property. Like if we were working late, like if we were preparing for a trial, um, like we would open our door and there was somebody like, like they're, they're having sexual intercourse, basically. It's, it's really disgusting. Um, and then June 2018, only the pot lights were approved. Um, we received that check six months later. Um, and I'm sure David Vanderberg is on this call and not to throw anyone under the bus, but just the administration and the amount of time that took place just to get $1,500 was crazy. Um, all the emails that we had to send just to say like, um, like when can we get the payment? Um, and then also um, we were told later that we need to then submit a new application just because the time um, involved and that to continue with the other work, we need to, we need to submit a new application. So I did that in July 2019, and then you'll see from the timelines that continued damage, um, like it just continued. Next slide, please. And then unfortunately, uh, in um, August 2019, there was a stabbing at the property. Um, we weren't allowed to go on onto the property uh, that entire day. Our cars were like locked there and the, the field police taped everything off. Um, it was a horrible experience. Um, it just and it just so happened that the people there they they ended up into this altercation. Um, so eventually, we had to think about um, our staff. We had to think about ourselves. We had to think about our clients. We had to think about our business. Um, running a law firm is not is not a cheap proposition. Um, so we completed the work uh, of without without the official approval from the city. So all of the drawings that we had um, and all the work that was being done. Uh, like so all the all the designs that we had come up with we went ahead and completed the work and the reason why we did that um, and just boots on the ground and being practical when you when you um, so the facade application process says that you know you need two estimates and then it has to be done within without a certain amount of time by the time you submit the application by the time you get the approval the contractors change um, you're not able to um, you're not able to get the funds. Um, and by the time you get the funds, the contractors are not available. And then by the time the contractor's available, it's not the season to do the property. Um, it's, not the, it's not the season to do the renovations. Like there's, there's, there's all sorts of um, like components that go into renovations. And I think the city kind of uh, failed to see that, that it's not just me, or it's not just simple as getting an, a, a, an estimate, but we had the estimate, we provided it. So uh, we did we did um, complete the work, and then when we submitted it to uh, the city, um, it was refused because we were told that it wasn't officially approved. Although nothing had changed from the original drawings that we had submitted, and it was all we were working collaboratively with the city. So it was not like here it's officially approved, and now like it's so it was a very collaborative approach. Um, so then in March 2020, I was asked to present to this committee and now from March and now it's June. So um, I finally got my day to be here, but I've been, this property has been uh, before uh, city council a number of times. And just to give you a small snip, a snippet of that, uh, during last year, I came to the security, uh, sa safety and security committee. I was told you have five minutes to speak, which is fine, but the rest of the 45 minutes and Pat Fortini was um, in that meeting 
that we were talking about wild raccoons in Brampton. And I just, I felt really, really upset because I'm like, wild raccoons are more important than somebody who's suffering real damage to a business. And I'm told I have five minutes to speak. Um, next slide, please. So this is a before and after, just to give you perspective. So the left side is the before. You'll see that there was, um, so we would leave and then people would come sleep on our property. You'll see the deck, um, it was ripped off. You'll see the garbage um, and the blue circle there, you'll see that's where people were going in. And then this is this is after on the right hand side, a much more cleaner look. Um, we've put a fence around it so nobody uh, can get in after hours. Um, people know that we're only there until five o'clock. It's, it's pretty obvious. Um, and it's more secure, it's more beautified, it looks better, um, it's more attractive. So, so that's the work that we did. We've, we've submitted all the official um, bills that we had to the city and everything is there. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'm, I'm very, very sure that this is not the first time uh, somebody's heard about 12 Church Street. Um, I grew up in Brampton. I, I've lived in Brampton my whole life, but unfortunately, um, I, I don't want to leave, uh, leave my business. Um, all, everybody, all the other lawyers that went to law school with us, they are practicing in uh, downtown Mississauga. They always tell us, you guys need to come and practice and open your law from here. But the amount of clients that we've lost, and especially the number of staff, like it is so embarrassing because they get here at 9 a.m., sometimes before us, and they're cleaning up like needles and nachos and tacos and things like that and clothes, which is disgusting, and people sleeping there. So it's so we had to do this for the safety of our staff. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I do see Councillor Santos, but you don't have a question for this delegation. Councillor Fertini, do you have a question for the delegation or for staff? Uh, for delegation, through Chair. Okay, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Harpreet. I just wanted to clarification. You said I was there. I was talking about raccoons. I don't remember myself talking any time about raccoons. Do you want to clarify it, that? It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't you, but you were oh, present okay. at that meeting. Okay. And, okay, I, I see. and you, and you yeah. supported me, um, and, you, and we discussed this there, and you definitely supported me because you knew about the property. But the other um, uh, previous okay. uh, counselors that were there, so for example, Elaine Moore, um, she was much more um, just concerned that, okay, no, the, the raccoons, we need to talk about that. And it's just disappointing. Like, where are our priorities? Okay, thank you. I just wanted some thank clarification. You. I do remember <laughs> when you were there. I, if, it, if, it, if it came out a different way, but no, that was that was not on you. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Councillor Fortini. Uh, my next, uh, so we'll go to Councillor Santos, and you have a question regarding uh, our report item 8.4. Thank you, and through you, Chair, uh, just to acknowledge Harpreet, thank you very much for your delegation, and I, I, I feel for you with respect to some of your concerns. Um, just a question for staff about the application uh, process, if you could clarify, and if you could bring the report up on the screen. Um, my first question is just in regards to the process itself. If you could explain why the application um, was not um, approved. And also, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Clerk, forwarding to the image of what was recommended by staff um, and considered as a facade improvement, that would be greatly appreciated. So staff, if you could comment on why the application was not approved for the facade improvement program specifically, and also if we can see the pictures of what was re recommended by staff. Through you, Mr. Chairman, this is Alan Parsons here. Um, I would ask that uh, David Vandenberg or Deputy Friedman, the authors of the report, respond to the councillor's question. Thank you. So yes, just, to, just, to, just to briefly highlight that, sorry, um, just, just one point there. Um, one of the city's recommendations was that we, we shouldn't remove the porch, but the Peel Police re reports con consistently show that the porch was the, was the cause of the entire issues because people were living underneath it. It was pretty high. So okay. that's, that's where that started. So, 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 just, okay. sorry, Mark, so uh, sorry, Mr. Chair. So just, just to be clear, um, Harpreet, Harpreet, again, I totally hear from you, but the facade improvement program has very specific elements um, that have to be followed uh, for the approval process. So I realize that 
there's some safety issues and concerns that you have had ongoingly on that property, but the facade improvement program uh, doesn't necessarily speak to or plead for or support those specific safety measures. So if staff can please comment on why the facade improvement program application was not approved in this case. And if we could please see um, what in the report, what was recommended by staff. Yes, through the chair, this is David Vandenberg. Um, so really there was two reasons that the facade improvement was not approved in, approved in this case. The first was that the implementation guidelines for the program, which really set out the rules for it. Um, they include a number of requirements. And one of them is that the facade improvement has to meet the design guidelines as part of the program. And the design guidelines are very clear that the removal of porches is not is not something that's eligible for um, a grant. It does not meet the guidelines. Um, so that is one reason is that the, the approved, proposed improvements did not meet or the improvement that was done did not meet the guidelines. The second is that the implementation guidelines are also clear that the um, approval has to be received before the work is done. In this case, the application was submitted at the end of July and staff did the site visit on August 1st and found that the work had largely been done. So if you look at the in the photos of the site, so all the work except for the fence was done by August 1st. So those were the two basic reasons that the application was not supported. Um, and then as you noted know, here, appendix two, this is a drawing. We always try to work with applicants on finding a design that's appropriate for the site and that tries to address the concerns that they may have. So this design that's shown on the screen right now was prepared by urban design staff of the city to address some of the concerns that were known for safety and as well maintain the, the urban design architectural character of the dwelling. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. And I think I'm not sure if Councillor Pileshi wants to speak, but there is a question about whether or not this house is uh, heritage list on the heritage list or designated. Uh, through the chair, I know it's not designated. I would have to double check if it is on the heritage list. I don't believe it it's, is. It's not. It's not heritage property. Okay. So, again, I do not see any. Um, further uh, questions or comments? Um, I do have a motion moved by Councillor Santos to approve the report recommendations and receive the delegations uh, that the report titled Recommendation Report Facade Improvement Grant um, dated May 29th to the Planning Development Committee meeting of June 22nd be received. That application uh, BFIP 2019-0009 of Church East Street West be refused for a grant under the Downtown Facade Improvement Pro Program as a request does not satisfy the eligibility criteria for the Downtown Brampton Facade Improvement Program and is not consistent with the Downtown Facade Improvement Design Guidelines. That the delegations from Harpreet Sidhu and Yuvraj China, property owners, 12 Church Street East be received. Uh, is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you, there are no objections, so the motion carries. Our next item is uh, item 6.5. I think this was addressed already. Uh, and now we move on to item 6.6, .6, and that was addressed in item 5.4. Uh, and we have now item 6.7, uh, city initiated amendment to the zoning bylaw to unit dwelling parking provision. And we have two delegations, Jeswinder Paul Mocha and Arvinder Kaur. Uh, City Clerk, are they on? Uh, Jeswinder is here. And Jeswinder, you're in the meeting now, so you can unmute your mic and please proceed. Jeswinder, you can unmute your microphone and please proceed with your delegation. Hello. Okay, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, good evening to all of you. 
Uh, my major concern about the parking uh, for the second unit is uh, uh, I have two uh, five back splits in the city, and both of them have the same kind of problem because of those uh, we can't uh, register our uh, already renovated uh, basements uh, into the second units, which is concerning our uh, property value. Also, uh, it's um, uh, of no used be, uh, of uh, useful land and the useful property. So we are concerned about this. If uh, because of uh, only we have two cars in the property and uh, we have to have three cars for the second unit uh, dwelling. So this is what is our what is our concern. If the parking uh, law can be amended to uh, two cars or uh, something like that, that would be a great help. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Arvinder Carr. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Arvinder has not joined the meeting. So that was only the, only the one delegation. Okay, thank you. So I do have uh, now um, a motion that uh so the annotated okay the i have a motion that's moved by councillor vicente uh yeah. to, to approve the report recommendations and receive the delegations that the report titled recommendation report city initiated zoning bylaw amendment two unit dwelling parking provisions citywide to the planning and development committee meeting of june 22nd be received that the zoning bylaw amendment attached uh, here too, as Appendix 1 be adopted on the basis as it represents good planning, including that is consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms to a place to grow growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the Region Appeal Official Plan, and the City Official Plan for the reasons set out in the planning recommendation report May 29th, uh, that hereby determined that in adopting the attached zoning by law amendment, Council has had regard for all matters of provincial interest and provincial policy. The council hereby determined that no further public notice is given pursuant to section uh, 3417 of the Planning Act and that the de delegations from Jezwinder Palmoka uh, from Brampton Resident be received. And sorry, members of committee, I overlooked, there's a, uh, I think Councillor Bowman wanted to ask a question on or speak to item report 8.5. Uh, Councillor Bowman, my apologies. Go ahead. No problem. Thank you very much. It's been a long night, Councillor Medeiros. <laughs> um, I would like to defer the recommendations in this report um, to a later date when, because planning is already undertaking a comprehensive municipal parking strategy to determine on-street parking approach and other parking related issues. And I believe uh, this needs to be part of that overall parking strategy. So I would like to defer this until we get to the parking strategy uh, approvals. Okay, thank you, Councillor Bowman. So we have a deferral uh, and uh, City Clerk, uh, just a reminder for everyone, uh, a deferral is not debatable, is that correct? Uh, that is correct, Mr. Chair. And I'd like a recorded vote, please. Okay, and we have a recorded uh, vote. So I'll hand this over to you, City Clerk, to handle the recorded vote. All members in favor of the deferral for report item 8.4 excuse me, 8.5, um, to a point in time when the overall parking strategy is reported back to committee or council. Councillor Santos? No. Councillor Vasante? No. Councillor Willens? Yes. Councillor Pileschi? Yeah. Councillor Bowman? Yes. Councillor Medeiros? No. Councillor Williams? Yes. Councillor Fortini? No. Councillor Singh? No. Councillor Dillon? No. Mr. Chair, uh, that motion does not carry. Uh, the vote is four to six. Okay, thank you. So, uh, members of the committee, please let me know on the chat. Oh, so I do have a Another speaker to 8.5, Councillor Santos, go ahead. 
thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, I believe that all the correspondence related to this item is also being discussed as well and accepted. Is that correct? Just want to confirm. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. So through you, uh, Mr. Chair, for any and all uh, people who sent in correspondence supporting the recommendations in this report, um, and I understand that the staff are indeed, which is why I voted for the defer to, against the defer. Yes, staff are all ready. Can you hear me? I am. Yeah. Yeah. So staff are already working on the uh, parking strategy across the city uh, to also include this as well. But I, I want to bring up the correspondence. So to everybody who wrote correspondence supporting these recommendations, please be very aware, very aware that it does not allow for cars to be parked on the streets uh, as, as sort of a makeshift way for any extra parking spaces um, that are no longer required as per what it was before. So I just wanted to really make that point. Um, and we will be, um, staff is bringing forward um, a strategy and plan on how to deal with on-street parking as well. But just, just I know that residents have been waiting for this for a while, and I appreciate that. But for all of the people who brought in correspondence, be aware that you cannot, this does not allow you to park on the street. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Santos, our uh, resident uh, street police. So I will hand this over now to uh, Councillor Vicente and then followed by Councillor Bowman. Go ahead, Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to first uh, uh, thank staff for working with members of council for many months now to bring forward uh, this motion here today. Uh, we've, we've seen how uh, over time uh, we have a, a need to allow for uh, secondary units to be constructed, but we want to make sure that it is not a necessity to uh, insist that with every secondary unit, you necessarily have to consider the uh, need for a vehicle. There are many situations within this city and others where uh, a person may desire to install a second unit and they would have two spots, three spots, four spots, whatever that number may be, but perhaps they only have two. And if they choose to uh, construct the secondary units and lease that out in order to A, uh, derive some additional income, B, assist all of us in contributing to affordable housing here in the city of Brampton, we wanna make sure that we think about that need first, and not necessarily about factoring in a car as part of that equation. Particularly in so many areas of the city where transit is readily available, it would be a person's right to rent out a secondary unit to someone who does not have a car, or if they so choose to allocate one of their available parking spots for that tenant to use, and that is a private understanding. Nowhere in, um, in this motion do we say that um, parking on streets would be allowed. As a matter of fact, the bylaws for parking already exist. They will continue to uh, be uh, modified and improved over time. And our bylaws stand ready to enforce parking on streets. But fundamentally, as we need uh, more secondary units and we don't want the traffic associated with more cars, we shouldn't by default request that a vehicle be part of that uh, construction. So I ask members of council to consider that and to support the motion. Thank you, Councilor Vicente. Uh, Councilor Bowman. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, very disappointed that this did not get deferred. I hear about this countless times every single day in our wards. Cars overhanging sidewalks, cars parked on the street for hours and hours and hours, cars parked on lawns, cars parked everywhere else. We are in a situation where this is not about anymore. This is not about all we need affordable second units. This is about business people buying up every property they can in this city and turning them into second units, turning them into apartments, becoming a business owner essentially is what they're doing. We, we had a workshop this morning 
and we talked about heritage heights and some of the words that were describing heritage heights this morning were they want a desirable image high value a family place what is the difference that's exactly what people regular residents who own these houses on streets who are raising their families do they not have the reasonable expectation of the same things we've got you know uh when we talk about creating value in undesirable places. Councillor Medeiros and I, we have Sheridan College in our ward, and not to say that Sheridan is the offender, but uh, in that area, we have probably 40 to 50% of those houses are basement apartments. Illegal, a lot of them. Legal, some of them. Garbage everywhere, complaints everywhere. We do not have the power and the strength uh, in bylaw to go out and ticket every single car that's parked wrong, every single car that's parked on a street. And that is exactly what's going to happen with with this motion. You know, they're going to say, oh, we're, we're not going to rent to somebody who has a car. And sure, they're sure they're not going to rent. And what about the next person who comes in and the person after that and the person after that? This is going to be a dog's breakfast and by not tying this in directly to the comprehensive municipal parking strategy for parking on roads we're, we're putting the cart before the horse here we're saying to all these people yeah you're good you can you can do that you only need two spots people are going to park on the road there's absolutely no question about it and now we're we're going to pass this bylaw we're going to let them do it and then later on we're going to come out with a comprehensive strategy on road parking um, after this is already over. And I don't think that should happen. These two things are directly tied together and we should have put them together in, in all aspects for the future report, but that was voted down. So thank you, council, but those are, that's just uh, my opinion on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Uh, I have now Councillor Palashi, go ahead. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, it's unfortunate that um, we didn't give, uh, I think, the opportunity for this to go back and, and maybe come back to Council with the complimenting report. Um, you know, I think Councillor Bowman is, is, is right um, with a lot of the comments that he has. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not against people buying houses and, and you know, renting them out as long as they do it in in the safest way possible um but i think that you know considering that we have uh, a future uh, report coming to a uh, future plan coming to us i i i, I agree with councillor uh, bowman's comments about putting the cart before the horse and uh it's unfortunate i i don't think that i like i'd like to support this when when it comes with the with the with the plan coming back but um I, I don't think I can now that um, we, we're not giving that the opportunity I think it deserves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor uh, Palachi. Uh, as I don't see any further uh, uh, questions or comments, uh, I have a motion. And Councillor Bowman, would you like a recorded vote on this motion? Sorry, yes, please. Okay, so we have uh, City Clerk uh, recorded vote regarding the motion moved by Councillor Vicente. All in favor of the motion as shown on the screen, Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Vicente? Yes. Councillor Willens? No. Councillor Pileschi? No. Councillor Bowman? No. Chair Medeiros? Uh, yes. Councillor Williams? No. Councillor Fortini? Yes. Councillor Singh? Yes. Councillor Dillon? Councillor Dillon? Sorry, yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, that motion carries six to four. Okay, thank you. Um, our next item uh, is uh, my on. My apologies, planning 8.1, and I think I think this was pulled. Uh, so we dealt with this already. 
Sorry, 8.1? 8.1, yeah. Yeah, okay, so 8.1. Um, so are there any questions or comments? No, so I have a motion moved by Councillor Fortini that the staff report titled Site-Specific Amendment to Sign Bylaw uh, 399-2002 Canadian Tire. Uh, 2850 Queen Street East Ward 8 to the Planning and Development Services Committee meeting of May 11, 2020 be received that a bylaw be passed to amend signed by law 399-2002 as amended to permit the proposed site-specific amendment. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you. There are no objections, so the motion carries. Our next item is item 8.2, site-specific amendment to the signed by law 17 Ray Lawson Boulevard, Unit 9, Metrolinx Ward 4. Are there any questions or comments? No, I have a motion moved by Councillor Bowman to approve the report recommendations that the report titled uh, Site-Specific Amendment to Sign by Law uh, 399-2002 Metrolink, 17 Ray Lawson Boulevard, uh, Unit 9 to the Planning Development Service Committee meeting of March 23rd, 2020 be received, that a bylaw be passed to amend Sign by Law 399-2002 as amended to permit the proposed site-specific amendment. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? Otherwise, your vote will count in the affirmative. Thank you. There are no objections, so the motion carries. Uh, we go now to item 8.3. Uh, staff report, uh, exemption, oh, this was already taken care of, right, City Clerk? That's correct. Yeah. 8.4, 8.5, 8.6, 8.7, 8.8, 8.9, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22,
uh, in its place put in a cond condominium, for example. Are those existing applications currently under review grandfathered in um, before this, or um, are, are they going to have to adjust? Through the chair, um, what is currently being proposed today is um, a draft official plan amendment um, to modify the current policies uh, that apply to residential developments or sorry, rental units. Um, so it would prohibit the conversion or loss of, of rental units through demolition. Um, so if an application was received prior to the adoption of that official plan amendment, it would not be subject to those provisions. Okay. So potentially there could be a loss of units. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Santos. Would you be willing to move uh, the staff report? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Great. Uh, anyone opposed? Okay. Approved. Our next item is 8.7. Uh, I'm not sure who Councillor held Plushy. that back. Councillor Plushy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> Just, I guess, really quickly, um, what are what are the next steps in um, in with respect to this property? And I guess what fines have been laid to date? Um, and I had another question, um, but I'll I'll stay with those two for now. Anyone? Anyone from staff? Oh, sorry, through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Alan Parsons here. My, my microphone is just on mute, sorry. Um, just uh, in responding to Councillor Pelleschi, Councillor Pelleschi, I, I can't confirm at this point in time uh, the detailed steps of, uh, of enforcement matters on the site. I, I, I can say that in having some discussion with, uh, with legal staff, uh, things are active with respect to the site. Uh, we have uh, talked about really the, the timing of when this report would go for, forward uh, through to committee here and understanding that uh, legal staff and enforcement staff are, are following up on the matter. Uh, for more specifics than that, uh, I would have to defer to somebody from, from legal. So I would ask legal or, or enforcement to comment and then also comment on the lands south that are currently um, also zoned the same and have um, a number of, of of trucks. I think if for some staff, Council may, uh, Council Willens will remember this, but very similar situation on Mississauga Road and Steels was nicknamed Tent City. Um, <clears throat> they went through kind of everything to try and keep the keep the ball rolling and and operate as long as they could. Um, you know, I I. I feel so sorry for the residents that are um, backing on or, or in this area. Um, but I, so I'd like to understand from, from, from enforcement um, a little bit more detail in, in this property. Um, you know, how long have they been operating to date? Uh, how many fines have been, or how many times we visited the site uh, for fines? Um, and, and how fast are we? Are we now that we've refused the application, are we going back to, to have them uh, remove all the containers? I, maybe Councillor Singh will probably know too if, if you want to um, move to Councillor Singh. Councillor Dillon's on there as well. Um, Councillor Dillon would know the history more than myself because it started uh, many years ago, so I'll let him answer that. Sorry, can you, what's the specific question, Councillor uh, Plushy, through um, to the chair? I guess, Councillor Dillon, uh, through the chair, do you know how many how many years has, have they been operating in this on this site? Uh, it's been a number of years. Um, uh, pretty much um, the duration of the existence of the, uh, of the area uh, around there. And so uh, the residents, um, you know, of you know, they've been told, you know what, it was only going to be there uh, temporarily, um, but it's been there forever. And so if you actually go to the uh, some of these people's backyards, you see, like, 
these big trucks loading and unloading, you know, throughout the day, throughout the nights become such a nuisance for them. Um, they can't get to sleep. Uh, it's really uh, disturbed their existence there. They, they, they're, you know, every day they're, they're calling us to check in on, uh, what the update of this file is. And, you know, we gotta, you know, uh, on many times let them know, you know, you gotta wait still. Um, but, um, I, I think Alan can let us know the exact time frame, but it's been quite a long time. And then just with respect to, um, the enforcement side of things, do we have anybody from enforcement on? Through the chair, uh, Councillor Pileshi, it's Matthew Ray from Legal. Hey, Matt. Um, I don't believe that enforcement regularly attends these these meetings, but what we can do, um, I don't have specific knowledge of this particular application. I'm not involved with it. But what we can do is undertake to um, get you an update, uh, get council an update, and report back at the next meeting on your questions. I can't release yeah. my own microphone. Oh. Elizabeth, are you on? Oh, you're are not. You? There you are. Am I on mute? Sorry, apologize. Yeah, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry. I, I can't speak specifically to all of the efforts that my law enforcement staff have been making over the past several years. However, I can confirm that there have been uh, numerous court dates, and in fact, um, registered convictions for the zoning violation for the parking of the trucks and trailers on this property. Um, most recently, I believe um, last year was the last opportunity that we had to be before the courts. Obviously, there has been some consideration at the um, provincial court level of this application going before council and um, the time frame that's associated with bringing an application like this to council for a decision. Um, but there has been no cessation of um, enforcement efforts on, in this very important um, issue, recognizing that it has been very impactful on the residents that back directly onto it. Um, I do want to note as well um, for Councillor Pileshi and through you, Mr. Chair, um, in response to some of the other land uses which have actually been developed for buildings and where outside storage has been occurring, um, none of the lands in this area and are actually zoned to permit outside storage of any kind, and that would include any oversized motor vehicles. Um, so while some have actually been developed for industrial uses, and by that I mean there's actually a building situated on the lot, which would be a requirement for any outside storage to occur, um, there, there is still no permissions in the existing zone that applies to all of these lands that would otherwise permit outside storage of vehicles in this area. No, and thank you for that, and through you, Mr. Chair, and, and I had noticed that, but I had also noticed, um, <clears throat> you know, passing through not too long ago and, and from a bird's eye, um, that the develop, the land to the south is starting to creep up there. But, uh, you know, Councillor Dillon and Councillor Singh would know a lot more about that than I would, um, and I won't continue to speak on that. What I will say, though, is... You know, we know that there's a need for this, um, you know, in the city of Brampton, the province of Ontario, um, but that need is not in in our farming areas or um, more specifically close to our residential. We have a lot of areas in Brampton um, that can can house this type of, of business, this low employment um, business, and I mean low by the number of of jobs that this is that this creates. In, an, in our industrial areas and um, the issue of course being that this land is a heck of a lot cheaper than land in in the industrial areas which is which is unfortunate but uh, uh, thank you to staff for um, uh, putting forward the refusal of the application and uh, you know I think <clears throat> with the vote today you'll probably see that council will always support um, this kind of um, of report coming from staff because it's the right thing to do when it affects people's livelihoods, which this does. Um, I think you always see council not support applications like this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilor Pelushi. Uh, Councilor Santos, did you, I see you on the board. Was that for the previous item? That was for the previous item. 
Okay, so Councillor Singh, go ahead. You know what, uh, Councillor Plessy spoke well. He's pretty much said everything I wanted to say. Uh, the only thing I'll add is uh, actually the residents uh, wanted to um, come on uh, potentially, but I told them not to worry that, that I don't think uh, the report speaks for itself and council, I think will support the direction. Um, but they've been concerned for a long time, but I didn't want them to, well, me and Councillor Dillon didn't want them to wait the slate just to delegate. Um, so, but they are supportive of this report. Thank you to staff for all the work uh, you've done. Okay, thank you, Councillor Dillon. Uh, no, I'm okay, Chair. Okay, Councillor Dillon, since I have you, uh, are you happy to move the, the motion? Yes. Mr. Chair, okay. Councillor Fortuna uh, is on the, on the list. Yeah, I see Councillor Fortini. I just want to ensure that Councillor Dillon was okay to move it. Go ahead, Councillor Fortini. No, it's, uh, thank you. It's okay. Everyone said enough. I was going to say the same thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Fortini. So, members of committee, we have uh, a motion moved by Councillor Dillon. Is anyone opposed? Mr. No. Chair, sorry, I, I would ask that Councillor Singh be attached to this motion too. It's it's important. Okay, so uh, Councillor Pelushi working on behalf of the residents of 9 and 10. Well done, sir. Councillor Dillon and Councillor <laughs> Singh, go ahead. I will add both of them to the motion. Uh, and uh, please, uh, as read, anyone opposed? No, we'll move ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, item now 8.8. .8. Close out procedure for inactive development applications and site plans citywide. Uh, I'm Councilor not Pelushi. sure. Yeah, Councillor Plushy, go ahead. Uh, no, that's okay. I've had my answer, my questions answered. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Do you want to move the staff report then? I'm fine with that. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Plushy. So, uh, is there anyone opposed uh, to? Uh, um, staff report, the motion moved by Councillor Pelleshi. No, okay, so uh, motion uh, carries. Uh, we go now to item 8.9, City of Brampton response to provincial policy statement. Councillor Santos. Councillor Santos, go ahead. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Very quickly, as I was reading it, there were concerns around the uh, updated policy and its alignment with our push on the climate change file and climate change issues with respect to planning and development. Is there any significant impact on our prioritization of um, of climate change and sustainability? And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering more specifically about the sustainability assessment score and if if this new policy from the province is in place and and has watered down um, initiatives on climate change, um, what is the impact for us? Like, do just the sustainability assessment score and other initiatives and priorities do, does that no longer have teeth? Hello. Yep. Go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Chair, um, uh, members of the committee. My name is Bindu. Um, so yes, we have reviewed this from that perspective. And uh, all we can say is that um, there are um, the city through the future um, community energy and emissions reduction plan and through its ongoing work on the sustainability initiatives and also through our official plan review and new policies on climate change that will be incorporated in the official plan. We will strive to address the, these issues and that there'll be no watering down of our efforts or policies um, on that aspect. So we are very conscious that what if, if, if this policy is not as strong, we will make up for it in our own plans and policies. Thank you. Okay, I have some follow-up questions to that for staff, but I'll take that offline and deal with it later. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Councillor Santos, and uh, uh, I'll have you as the mover of the motion. That staff report, um, uh, as uh, um, explained in the motion on the screen. Uh, anyone opposed? Okay, Kerry, thank you. Uh, item 8.10. Councillor Singh. Councillor Singh, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, so um, Councillor Dillon, I believe, is going to put a deferral, but I'll just uh, speak um, for the thinking behind that is, uh, you know, th this is, uh, well, first of all, we got a lot of um, residents saying they didn't know about this as I asked them, so, I, I, and I get it's COVID right now, 
Um, so, uh, you know, it's a challenge, but uh, this is an uh, important area and there's another development right beside this coming uh, to uh, council as well. So we just wanted the opportunity to uh, get uh, the public, uh, just to let them know what's going on um, and, and ask uh, staff. They have some concerns about parkland and, uh, and other issues and some of the density. So just need some time to make sure that, uh, you know, the public uh, is fully consulted in this and um, some other issues that we have um, are also addressed. Uh, so that's why um, uh, Councillor Dillon, I believe, will be speaking and putting a deferral. Okay, thank you, Councillor Singh, for uh, our, um, the setup. Here we go now to, I see you, Councillor Santos, are you on the board? No, that was from last time, but thanks for checking. Okay, Councillor Dillon, go ahead. I just want to move referral, a uh, deferral, sorry. Okay, so deferral is non-debatable. Um, anyone opposed to the deferral? Sorry, Sorry, to you, Mr. Link. Chair, uh, just to clarify, yeah. I just want to get deferral to when or to a specific time or to a specific, after a specific event? Yeah, after I, I we just uh, talked to staff, so, um, we could do next planning meeting uh, for now. So the next planning meeting right now is July 6th, followed by July 27th, and then followed by September 14th. Yeah, we'll do the 6th for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. So moved by Councillor Dillon that the item be deferred to July 6 uh, for the meeting of the Planning and Development Committee. Uh, is anyone opposed? Okay, carried. Um, then we go on now to new business. I believe Councillor Vicente, you added an item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, so members of the committee, uh, we're bringing forward a bit of a housekeeping motion here dealing with the village of Churchill, uh, which is a heritage, uh, a heritage district. And within the heritage district, there are certain aspects of the village that are codified into the bylaw, which are meant to be protected. And the Ontario Heritage Act requires that municipalities shouldn't uh, do any public work in a district that is contrary to the objectives of the heritage district itself. Um, the, uh, the bylaws would include in this case, the maintenance of the roads and roads without curbs, curb-free roads to keep the village to a more rural um, profile. And uh, we've had uh, some input from local residents who care deeply about uh, this heritage district and they spoke with both myself and Councillor Willens on this and based on their input we had uh, a concern raised when a local resident is submitting an application to uh, planning uh, for example to sever a parcel the city may on occasion at its discretion require that as part of the approval of that application that a conveyance of a certain amount of land uh, from the applicant be ceded to the city um, in order to allow for future road widenings or other works projects. But um, while that would be kind of normal in other parts of the city of Brampton, in this heritage district, it kind of goes against, well, it does go against the uh, objectives of the Heritage District. Um, both Councillor Willens and I worked with staff to prepare this motion for committee's uh, consideration. Legal staff uh, assisted in the drafting of this motion. It provides for uh, the city to not as a matter of uh, due course to require conveyance of land, but doesn't uh, necessarily uh, mean that if the city or the municipality absolutely needed to have uh, a conveyance of land in the future for some unforeseen public works project, they could do so through other means. Uh, Councillor Willens, uh, I don't know if you want to also speak to this. Um, I would prefer that the motion is moved by the local area councillors. So I just leave this here for consideration. Yeah. Oh, I'm okay. I think uh, Councillor Palashi is on the board there. 
Yeah, Councillor Pelosi. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wollens. Councillor Pelosi, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to ask staff, there was um, there is discussion about road widenings and any time that we have, um, you know, if if we have, if we're looking at, in this case, Hallstone Road and um, the opportunity down the down the road to 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 widen it, um, it's going to be a lot easier for the council of the day and and um, and city staff after this motion to go ahead and widen a road like this, um, as opposed to expropriation of a road. Can I get? Um, Alan, uh, just to comment on that. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman. So, yeah, the, the motion as uh, put forward by Councillor Vicente and uh, as uh, staff have uh, had communications with, with him on that, it, it, it identifies that <clears throat> at, at this point in time, the, the lands would not be conveyed to us as it would be the normal case, but rather for the village of Churchville, uh, you know, any lands where we see that they're subject to a development application and they are identified by way of the official plan as having uh, the uh, a larger road uh, width than what currently exists. Typically, we would require that land conveyance to come to us through that application. But with uh, with the motion as put forward tonight, uh, that the staff would not seek that at that point in time. Uh, rather, uh, as noted in the the yet therefore resolved section of the motion. It, it identifies a, a number two uh, uh, paragraph there, and it, it identifies that uh, that staff would, though, uh, really have the opportunity to enter into an agreement with the landowner to identify that while we're, we're not receiving the lands at this point in time, uh, at a later point, uh, if it is determined that really the, the lands are, are, are critical for the delivery of infra infrastructure, then we, we do have that landowner uh, agreeing through the legal agreements that they would provide it at that later point in time. And so, and let me ask with Hallstone Road, um, is it currently under the Heritage District, Hallstone Road, does it meet its, its width requirements or is it just under the width requirements in the through district? Your, through, through Mr. Chairman, yeah, the, the one, uh, there's a, uh, it's site specific, uh, really it, it, there's portions of Hallstone that would, uh, would satisfy the OP designation and, uh, road with uh, identification, but, uh, there are certain properties that do not. Uh, and so there, there's, we've been dealing most recently with, uh, with one property through a consent to sever application and it does not satisfy that OP requirement. Uh, so really by way of the, uh, motion that's put forward tonight if passed uh, it'll be that staff would look to enter into an agreement with that uh, owner to then not take the lands at this point in time but uh, the owner would agree that if at a, at a later point in time there is a, again a very important infrastructure project then uh, then they would be willing to provide it at that point in time but uh, at that later point in time there, there would be a further uh, staff and the council involvement on, on the matter. And currently the OP takes into account the heritage district? It, it does, yes. And that's why you refer to it um, staying within the, within the OP? That's right, yeah. So I guess, and I, I think I, what I understand is, is, you know, we want this for future <clears throat> infrastructure needs. Those infrastructure needs are mainly utility and service and not necessary, necessarily um, road widenings. But my only concern is this does give staff um, the ability to to widen the road if, if, if that's the case in those specific areas that they're a little bit less than, um, than what's allowed for the wide, width of the road now um so that's all uh, that's my only issue really with this and to the effect that you know if if we widen hallstone the number of cars that use this area as a bypass now um is is uh, is a real concern for the residents of of churchville um because the exiting of of churchville is is isn't the best of conditions and and sometimes if anybody knows churchville 
you know, from steals uh, all the way down to the bridge is is often. I'm there every uh, every Tuesday for my rapier. Every Tuesday, the first Tuesday of every month for my rapiers group, and it's it's sometimes insane just to try and get down there um, with the with the traffic that that backs up through the through Churchville, and then the fact that the bridge. Um, I don't know how much longer that bridge can last with the amount of traffic that's that's going on there now, that old rickety heritage bridge. bridge. So that's my concern. So, Alan, can you, is there anything that we can add to this motion to ensure that, you know, the future widening of the roads um, will not happen uh, in the district? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, just what's perhaps comes to mind is that uh, there could be some edits to number two, perhaps, so in the, in the, there, it, uh, there before be resolved a section which identifies that the, uh, the agreement that I, that I referenced, whereby the landowner would be willing to provide those lands at a later point in time, if, uh, if it was deemed necessary, that uh, it be identified that it be solely for infrastructure works that don't uh, involve the widening of the pavement, perhaps. So yeah, if, if it is, Councillor, you're, you're concerned that a uh, widening of the road pavement itself uh, could be uh, achieved you know, through staff and through you know, uh, infrastructure improvement work, uh, and you're wanting to guard against that, uh, you, you, so, we, we could consider a reference where it's uh, identifying certain works under the road and not the, the road widening pavement with itself perhaps. Um, Councillor, and through the chair, uh, Bob Bierke, uh, Director of Policy Planning, just wanted to clarify that uh, through the official plan review, we will be uh, updating the references in, in these sections to more appropriately identify the heritage conservation districts as, as not uh, conforming to the full elements, the OP, and, and also looking at a little more area specific language for the uh, uh, for the road widenings and, and those other provisions. So they will be coming within the next uh, uh, you know, update to the, the official plan. We will have a way of dealing with this in a more comprehensive way. Okay, so can this motion then hold off till then? Certainly uh, would be uh, your call. I don't think there's any pressing uh, works anticipated in this area. Um, and, and we certainly know what the, the direction is. Uh, I know this was undertaken sort of an abundance of caution, but I, I would suggest within the next two years we, we would have this uh, addressed. <coughs> oh, okay. It's something okay. So, so I think. Sorry, I will just speak to the mo uh, the the motion just for for a second, and really the the current context as well. Um, like w w without the the motion passing tonight, you know, it, it would be that really as a standard course, you know, staff would. Uh, feel the need to uh, request that uh, any landowner provide the conveyance to us for, for our infrastructure needs. And uh, as I made mentioned, there is a current consent to sever application that, that staff are currently deliberating on. It'll, it'll be dealt with likely in July. And uh, with the motion, however, passing, what, what it will do is uh, result in the, those this, the strip of land along Hallstorn Road not being conveyed to city staff and the city at this point in time. Rather, as mentioned, there'll, there'll be an agreement which could speak to a, a future conveyance of it. So uh, there, there is some uh, time sensitivity as it relates to the one application anyhow, and it, it was seen generally as some improvement as it relates to that application to, to not have those lands conveyed uh, at, at this point in time. Okay, so I think, um, you know, given that, if if the clerk captured um, what Alan um, had said, I, I'd like to move that as an amendment. I think that Councillor Willens, if he's moving this motion, um, I would ask him to support or take that as a friendly. Um, but if, if Mr. Clerk, you didn't capture it, then I'm happy to just uh, refer this to Council next week. Um, and then and then get the language embedded and then and then move it at that time so through you mr chair no i haven't captured the um the motion charlotte's trying to document some of it now so other, if okay, this language so, is not so satisfactory I, then it could be uh, as you said it could be referred to council on wednesday this is these are where the recommendations will land for council ratification in in the interim period 
uh, staff can work uh, with with you to draft language that would be satisfactory. Okay, so through you, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to to um, to move that uh, refer over to to council and to keep the agenda moving. Mr. Chair. Yep. Okay. That is. Uh, um, that is fine. Do you? So is this motion? It oh, was a discussion of request of Councillor Vicente. Okay, and uh, so we do have a motion moved by Councillor Palashi to refer this uh, item uh, to Council next week. Is there anyone opposed? It would be to Council this week on Wednesday. Oh, my apologies to Council this Wednesday. Is anybody opposed? Oh, I'll hold, refer I'll hold my referral until Councillor Willens speaks. Okay, Councillor Willens, go ahead. Yeah, I know, speaking of the referral, yeah, that's, uh, um, I'm good with that uh, for Wednesday, just to make sure we get the wording correct. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you, and thank you, Councillor Vicente is here with it as well. Okay, uh, anyone opposed? No, Carrie, thank you very much. Um, no other new business, referred matters. Uh, do any members have any questions regarding the referred matters list? No, uh, no deferred matters, notice of motion. Uh, correspondence has been dealt with already. And the next item, Mr. Chair, would be item 15, councillor question yep. period. Yeah, you beat me to the punchline. Uh, any members, uh, are, uh, do any councillors, uh, do any uh, members of the committee have questions? No. Public question period. Are there any questions, uh, City Clerk? Uh, Mr. Chair, there are, but before I start that, I just wish to clarify, there was the video delegation early in the meeting that was uh, received as part of item 5.4, statutory public notice item. We clarified with the, the delegate to uh, put the video together, and in fact, it does relate to item 5.3, so the minutes will correctly show that that video delegation relates to that item. Um, there, is you, one, um, yep. there is one question that's come in that's in two parts. It's from Stephen Azoparty, and it is uh, in regards to item 5.3, the statutory public notice item earlier on the agenda. The question is, please advise if there are any roads from this proposed subdivision intersecting with Credit View Road north of Steeles. And this, the follow-up was, and also, is the bottom triangle previously 8220 Credit View Road? So this is in regard to item 5.3 on today's agenda. Okay, I believe the staff have a... Uh... Yeah, through, through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, through to City Clerk. Uh, Peter, would, would you mind clarifying the first question with respect to uh, the, the reference to which type of road that, it's, uh, that the subdivision might intersect with? The, the question was, uh, please advise if there will be any roads from this new proposed subdivision intersecting with Credit View Road north of Steeles. So in response to that, I can advise Mr. Chairman that uh, the, the roads contained within the subdivision, they all really travel uh, westward uh, into the existing community to the west and uh, the roads do not travel uh, northerly. So they, they would travel out through to Mississauga Road. Okay, thank you very much. Is that, uh, and is there a second part there, Peter, or are we all good? There is a second part, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure, perhaps planning can understand it better. Also is the bottom triangle, um, previously 8220 Credit View Road. I'm not sure if they're referring to a bottom triangle that's part of the, the property boundary. And through through Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not able to answer that question right now. I, I'm just you know, trying to understand which location he's referring to, and I, I don't know the municipal address for that uh, perhaps portion of the property right now. So, City Clerk, can we ensure that staff follow up with uh, this delegation? Yes, we will. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Alan, again. And uh, members of committee, um, as I see, there's no further uh, public questions, we go to our last item, which is adjournment. Uh, our next committee is scheduled to meet 
Um, our next committee meeting is scheduled to meet Monday, July 6th at 7 p.m. I have a motion moved by Councillor Williams to adjourn today's special meeting. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? No, thank you very much. Stay safe, stay healthy, most importantly, stay home, practice physical distancing to help flatten the curve of this COVID-19 emergency. Uh, good night, everyone. Thank you.